We call the meeting to order. Um, so the first thing to do is to review and approve the agenda, and I have one change I would like to make, which is um, that we have some guests here from out of town who are presenting um, on the, the Heat and Woods loan reorganization, um, uh, reorganization of their loan. So um, since they have a, a far way to drive home, I'd like to bump them up to um, just after the Conservation Commission application, so that'll be an item like five and a half. Um, and then we'll, I don't anticipate that one will be very long. So um, we'll, we'll go on from there. Uh, any other um, ideas or questions about the agenda? Okay, so I'm gonna consider um, that the agenda approved without objection. Um, so next up is general business and appearances. Um, this is a time for any member of the public to come speak to the council on a matter that is not on our agenda. And um, just as a heads up, um, for this as well as um, any item that isn't on our agenda, our norm um, since this council has started is to, uh, for any member of the public who comes to speak, uh, please try to keep your comments to two minutes or less, and Donna will be helping us with timing that. So she'll hold up cards to let you know um, whether you should be winding down or um, whether your time is up. Um, so heads up about that, and I, I'll remind people again um, as it comes up. Uh, so anyway, so this is the time for anybody to address the council on item not on our agenda. Okay. Um, so moving on, uh, so consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Just a note on that. I got messages on two typos that have been fixed <laughs> and are reflected on the website. I would move that we approve the consent agenda with the fixed typos in the meeting minutes from 613. <laughs> um, for, so further discussion, any items? Um, I just uh, appreciate that with the police vehicle purchase that, you know, further down in our uh, agenda, we'll be discussing um, the strategic plan, and a part of that is considering um, uh, prioritizing non-fossil fuel vehicles in our uh, equipment purchasing. So um, we'll be talking about that further at a later time. All right, uh, yes. Could I just ask that the public refrain from chatting? It's really, it's hard for us to hear, and um, if you've got a conversation, to have it out in the hall, please. Thank you. All right, so uh, if there's no further discussion, say, okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that passes, thank you. Um, right, the Conservation Commission appointment. Um, so I believe we have one applicant for one seat. Correct. So would we have a motion about Conservation Commission? I yes. move that we appoint the applicant to the uh, Conservation probably Commission. Charlie Hahn. Charlie Hahn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Jack, is that a motion? Yes. And is there a second? Second. OK. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. All right, uh, so the uh, Heat and Woods uh, item, if, you, if you're here to represent that, that'd be great. Sure. Come on up. So I think probably the best way to do it is I'll give a kind of a background and then um, some folks from uh, Heat and Woods as well as um, uh, some folks from Heat and Woods, as well as uh, the um, the funders for their project, are also here to speak to to um, the request. Um, so, a little bit of background: um, the original uh, funding for Heat and Woods back in 1992, I believe, six hundred thousand dollars in community development block grant grant funds that were granted to the Montpelier Housing Authority. In 2015, Montpelier Housing Authority. Um, met with the folks from Living Well, um, who, and they expressed an interest in purchasing it, which activated um, a, a, a repayment provision. Um, initially, we had uh, we'd come to terms, and it was two years deferred, um, interest-only payments, which is the last two years from, until um, May of this year, and then a 15-year repayment period of principal and interest. The request came this year earlier as they were reaching the end of that deferment period, thank you, Kat. 
um, reaching the end of that deferment period that due to a number of unforeseen capital expenses and energy improvements, um, the request was to defer the loan um, uh, or turn it into a grant. Um, this is not actually an uncommon request. This is something that we have done um, for the downstreet when they're doing a, a, a renovation so that the, the community development block grant is, is secured by a mortgage. Um, and then we have in the past forgiven those in order to do a, a, reno, a, a renovation and to, to facilitate that refinancing. This is a slightly different situation because it was an outside entity. It is a non-for-profit. They do a lot of good work for low and moderate income folks and particularly our most um, needy folks uh, and our elderly. Um, it's a level three facility and I, they can explain what that means uh, better than I can. Um, so normally what we would do is we would call together the Montpelier Loan Fund Committee and the Loan Fund Committee would make a formal recommendation to council. Attempts earlier this year uh, to schedule everybody were difficult and then um, in June uh, two of the members resigned um, leaving us with three out of five and when the meeting was scheduled the third could not attend so we didn't have a quorum. I recorded the minutes of the two remaining uh, committee members, um, but there is no formal recommendation from the Montpelier Loan Fund Committee. As a result, <coughs> you are tasked with um, approving or denying the request from the Living Well Fund. Um, my recommendation, um, which is in, the, is in the memo, is that we do approve um, a, a long-term deferral. Um, with the provision that in, in the event that it is sold or transferred, um, that the repayment provision applies. So um, if it was sold to a for-profit entity, for example, it would be re the repayment would be required to the city and securing that, that, that you know, we can uh, recapitalize those funds. I should just make, thanks, Kevin. I should make sure. one clarification. The owner of the previous owner and developer of Eaton Woods was not Montpelier Housing Authority, but Capital City Housing Foundation. Capital City. Which is a foundation that's a subsidiary of the Housing Authority, essentially. And okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Kevin, yes. I, so I read the notes of the the committee meeting, even mm -hmm. though they weren't able to vote something out, um, and I see that um, committee member Klein had a, a suggested course of action. Is that exactly what you're recommending, or are you recommending something slightly different? No, I'm recommending something slightly different. Um, after talking to one of the challenges that we talked to, the, the loan that for their energy improvements is secured by uh, Vermont Community Loan Foundation. Um, and in partnership with Commons Energy. So one of the requirements of the Vermont Community Loan Foundation's underwriting criteria was that the, this loan had to become deferred um, and, and to take a subordinate position. Subordinate position, that's a pretty standard piece. We do it all the time um, on, on refinancing. But um, that was a requirement. So really the task at hand in front of us is that if this isn't approved, there's a good chance that that funding will not be approved, um, and so it's a it's a decision on um, you know deferring our interest, um, you know, out another uh, twenty years, uh, twenty two years, um, unless this this group decides to sell it uh, at some point, thereby tripping the repayment provision again. Well, you know, after having some conversations about this, I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with this. Um, I think it's a pretty, um, I mean, it's a important thing for our community, and it's low risk to the city. So um, I'm I'm pretty happy to support it. But um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. I I wondered if we reduce the amount of time or revisit it, because this came up because of unforeseen renovations were higher versus you said we did the same thing as we did before, which we expected to do with the other housing authority party. Um, so why does it, does it have to be tw the full 22, 20 years? 
I mean, could we do it like 10 and then revisit their status? My recommendation is, is that we do it, that, that it, it, it um, runs uh, f basically when the term ends for the first and second position for um, uh, the first and second position on, on commun commons energy and the, the loan fund, then that would kick in the payment provision when that's paid off. Um, so that was I see one loan gets paid off in 20 years. I missed that yes. piece. I'm so sorry. when that when that that loan is the loan that they're using to refinance is paid off, we okay. use that date as the as the starting repayment date. Okay. Or Thank deferral. Yeah. Any further motion? Yeah, the motion would be great. Okay. Um, uh, recommended recommended action is uh, approve that. The, well, uh, the, the city council approved the terms and conditions similar to the original community development loan terms offered to Montpelier Housing Authority. Does that need to be changed? Yeah, that should be changed too. <coughs> Capital city, city housing capitally capitally housing. Housing. To zero interest deferred for 20 years. Maybe you don't even have to refer to the other part, the previous. We can just say that the city council agrees to the terms and conditions of the $2 million loan? I think you could just say mortgage put, put forth by the Living Well Group. Yes. Is that okay. fair? Okay. Yeah. No, because no. what was put forth was two options, oh, one okay. of which was turning it into a grant, and we're not doing oh, that. Oh, okay. So, we we approved the long-term deferment of the mortgage on the property at zero interest deferred for 20 years. John Odom, does that make sense? <laughs> John, you're good with that? Okay. Second. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'll see you in a little bit. All right. See you. <laughs> I always double check out. Okay, so um, we have a couple of topics that I, I think there uh, may be a lot of discussion about, and people may be here to, to weigh on, in on um, uh, the proposed uh, smoking-free downtown uh, proposal as well as um, the, the item on dogs. Um, so I want to just uh, up front tell you that I want to structure this conversation uh, a little bit for us. And so here's how I anticipate um, these next couple items going. Um, um, uh, Ginny, I assume you and uh, others are here um, to present. Um, love to hear your presentation. Um, I'm estimating that that's going to be what, like 10, 15 minutes ballpark? Okay, great, that's fine. Um, at that point, I would love to go directly to comments from the public. Um, just going to go straight there. And, uh, you know, along the way, Council, if you have clarifying questions, that's fine, but let's hold off on our discussion until afterwards. Um, and then I, I would love to, uh, I mean, I'll have a, a pretty focused discussion um, after the comments from the public. So, uh, all right, so having said all of that, um, Ginny, why don't you come on up and take it away? So while they're pulling up extra chairs, uh, we have five people who are going to be speaking to you this evening. Uh, I'm going to introduce the team. Um, so we have Matt Whalen, who is a prevention consultant for the Barry District Office of the Vermont Department of Health. And he's going to talk about health issues of secondhand smoke. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of tobacco control in the national sense and also our experiences with this council over the years because uh, we have a little history. We have Liz Genge from Down Street who's going to give us some perspective on smoke-free housing. And we have Ron Merkin, a community advocate who has been working for the last year or more on a petition that he'll share with you. And then Ann Gilbert, who is the director of Central Vermont New Directions Coalition. She's going to do what I call the final focus. This is what they call it in debate. Um, and also a little bit about butt litter, because we can't leave that out. So Matt. Great. Uh, good evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Matt Whalen. I'm a substance abuse prevention consultant uh, operating out of the Barry Office of Local Health uh, through the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Programs to the Department of Health. And I serve Central Vermont. Um, I'm going to stick strictly to the facts here regarding secondhand smoke, um, starting with the fact that there is no safe amount of secondhand smoke 
uh, breathe, breathing even a little secondhand smoke can be dangerous. And that's directly from a 2014 Surgeon General report. That same report notes that tobacco smoke contains more than 7,000 chemicals, including hundreds that are toxic and about 70 that can cause cancer. So um, among Vermont adults uh, in 2016, 50% half reported exposure to secondhand smoke in the past seven days. And that's from the Vermont Adult Tobacco Survey that was hosted by our, the Vermont Tobacco Control Program in 2016. So that was a point in time measure, and about half Vermonters were exposed to secondhand smoke. <laughs> Uh, at the time of that same survey, 18% of Vermonters reported being current smokers. Uh, the important note there, in my opinion, is that 82% of Vermonters are not smokers. Per that same survey, 43% of current tobacco users made a quit attempt in the last year. So of those 18% that are smokers, about a little less than half are um, trying to quit is what that survey tells us. Another important fact of note in the Vermont Tobacco Survey, younger adults, racial and ethnic minorities, and those with lower income and lower education are more significantly, are significantly more likely to report secondhand smoke exposure. And those who are white, non-Hispanic, uh, older adults, and those with more education and income are less likely to experience secondhand smoke exposure. My last point, uh, from that same survey, 91% of Vermont adults believe that secondhand smoke exposure is very or somewhat harmful, leaving about 9% that think that secondhand smoke is not harmful to the body. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So we have a We've given you a bunch of documents that I guess only you have. I thought that they were going to be able to be um, shared with the audience, but I, I guess I didn't understand the technology. So you have them, and I might refer to them. You can find them. Um, so I'm going to reference a, a document called Secondhand Smoke and Smoke-Free Zones, which is just a quick history of tobacco control starting in the 60s, really, um, when you started to not be able to smoke on airplanes and in restaurants and various other places. Some of it was federal, some of it was local. Vermont was a leader in um, secondhand smoke control. Um, and every step of the way, there, were, there was opposition. There were people who didn't want this to happen for various reasons. Um, but as it did happen, every time there was progress in, in tobacco control, smoking rates went down which is how we got to 80-some percent not smoking now. Um, tobacco control really, really works. There's a document in there called Prevalence, Policy and Prevalence. It looks like this, and it's just a direct sh a demonstration of how when they pass a law, it goes down, and they pass another law, and it goes down. And this is a huge, huge public health victory. Um, most of the legislation and policy so far has been about indoor air quality, and we're talking here tonight about outdoor air quality, which is really the next public health frontier in this, in this topic. Um, on the more local level, we, uh, have, we came to you in 2016 to talk about a survey that we did in 2015. That is the survey looks like this. You, some of you have seen it before. I sent it to all the counselors also. Um, some highlights of what we found out here, and we had uh, 300 people or so in the pedestrian survey and 80-some um, in the businesses. Um, what we know is and think is important is that uh, on businesses, 46% of the respondents are supportive of some kind of restriction in the downtown. 59% think reducing smoking and secondhand smoke is important or very important to the downtown community. They mentioned litter a lot. Um, and they talked about designated smoking areas as a possible solution to restrictions. With the 285 responses um, and 10% of those of the pedestrians, 10% of those were smokers. 63% um, have been bothered by secondhand smoke in the downtown area. 56% have been bothered by butt litter. 
12% said they, if this passed, they might come to Montpelier less frequently. 14% said they'd come more often, and the rest said the same. Um, so it's not going to keep people away from downtown Montpelier if this happened. 60% said they supported the policy. 35% did not. The rest were non-committed. And again, they brought up this concept of designated smoking areas. We have two actual pres precedents with you. Um, we were instrumental in working with the city to get the parks declared smoke-free um, in 2015. And that was a couple of years worth of work with uh, the parks commission and um, working through things like, well, where would our employees go to smoke? And that, you know, all that problem solving that we always help with. And then the Parklets in 2018, that's another ordinance, um, which is more recent and they're smoke free. One of the things that has come up in discussion is could this be done by just adding on to the parks ordinance instead of creating a whole new one? Um, Barry last summer did add on to their parks ordinance a 25 foot perimeter. And then there's another document in there which is we came back after, you know, not, not getting um, traction on this and submitted another document that's in your packet about um, city council goals and how this would fit in with your goals for a healthy community. So in some, um, a smoke-free sidewalks in the downtown core would allow the 83% of adults who do not smoke and their children and their pets to safely move through the town without being exposed to carcinogenic substances. And that's, that's our pitch. So now it's mm -hmm. your turn. Thank you. Um, thanks, Matt. So thanks, Anne, too. I, when I saw you uh, about the main, specifically the French block apartments that, that are currently being renovated, right on Main Street, which this uh, is part of the downtown where the non-smoking would happen. Um, the French block will be our 17th building in downtown Montpelier that we'll manage as downstreet housing. And um, like all new properties that come on board with downstreet, the French block will be smoke-free. Smoking in our buildings must be at least 25 feet away from the building. Um, downstreet adopted a smoke-free policy in our multifamily portfolio in 2013. We rolled it out in stages. Um, we've been increasing, increasingly addressing concerns from renters that unwanted secondhand smoke in and around their home was really bothering their quiet enjoyment. And it was very important to us that we recognize how such a major rule change in someone's home um, would have an impact on, on a lot of our households. Um, so we took the time to listen to feedback. We communicated our reasoning for the policy. We staged the policy providing three or four months, I don't remember now. Notice we hosted meetings with our residents to explain our reason for the policy change. And not too many people came out to meet with us, but I do remember at the River Station Apartments, which is by the Hunger Mountain Co op, um, a great long standing resident, she looked at me and said, Liz, I gave up drinking, I don't do drugs, and now you're telling me I can't even smoke in my house. It is tough. It was tough for her, and it is fair that she had to make these changes in a life adjustment. But we're really grateful that she did. And now it's business as usual uh, for her and for all of our renters and all of our portfolio to smoke 25 feet away from the building. The building's healthier. We don't smell smoke anymore. Neighbors aren't complaining. Um, and I do see her still outside uh, smoking, and she's happy where she's living. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's worked out. Um, we did transfer that person into a fresh apartment after we made the change, uh, after the smoke-free policy went into effect. And it cost us over $5,000 to turn over that unit because of the nicotine and the smoke residue. There are financial reasons not to allow smoking indoors, and there's also safety benefits um, into the larger housing community when you lessen the chance of an accidental fire by a cigarette. So in our experience at Downstreet overall, folks understand our logic behind the smoke-free policy. They don't want to interfere with neighbors and staff with the secondhand smoke, and people generally all comply with the rule. Uh, so if Main Street is smoke-free, it'll just enhance our policy we already have in place um, at the French Block. The executive team at Downstreet Housing supports this, as well as me, and I live in District 3. So thanks. Oh, I'm the instigator to this whole uh, hearing tonight. <clears throat> I was here a couple of years ago when there was a, a public hearing about the same issue, establishing a smoke-free area in downtown uh, Montpelier. And I, as I remember, three people testified in favor of it, three people testified against it. Finally, a seventh person got to the microphone 
and said, this seems like it will be a contentious issue. After that, as I remember it, immediately there was a vote in the council, and with a unanimous approval, it was tabled until the next April. The next April, unfortunately, nothing happened. It was not revived mysteriously for a renewed conversation. So I got the idea, if we got a petition with a 1,000 signatures, would that bring, would that be, bring more uh, forcibly uh, attention to the city councilors that this was an issue that people were really concerned about, that it's more popular than you might think. That 1,000 signatures was actually surpassed. I finally got to 1,517 as of the last two days. The last two days, believe it or not, people have been contacting me because they've heard about this hearing to ask if they could uh, also sign the petition. So the latest figure is 1,537, which I think is fairly impressive. Uh, on the uh, right side of this petition, we had three boxes indicating, are you a smoker, uh, an ex-smoker, or a non-smoker? It surprised me how many smokers who signed the petition indicated that they were smokers. I was surprised enough so that every time they did it, I asked, why did you do it? And I always got the same response. I don't think it's fair to subject non-smokers to my secondhand smoke. This is honest to God. Uh, some of them also said that they thought if we had more smoking areas, it would help them quit. Uh, not, mo not all of them, but some of them indicated that also. I want to point out that uh, something I forgot, of those 1,537 signatures as of today, 49 are from proprietors of businesses and stores in the immediate downtown shopping area. I think this was a major concern in the past of the council. 49 people, as I said, who have stores or businesses in the downtown area signed the petition. Uh, because we've heard a lot of concern from councilors and we share the concern, as far as I know, and not wanting to marginalize smokers, we have dramatically reduced the area that we originally proposed. The first area was going to be wherever there are parking meters in the downtown area. Now the area is restricted to only four streets. Maine from Barry to the Kellogg Harvard Library, State from Maine to the beginning of the Capitol Plaza Hotel Complex, School Street where parents walk their children from Union Elementary School after school to after school activities at the Children's Library, and Park Avenue in front of Union Elementary School. I have personally walked and timed how long it would take me on all these different streets. And from that, I can tell you it would take one to a maximum of two minutes for somebody walking through there to get to the border where they could smoke once again. That's just one or two minutes. If they were in a hurry that they had to have a cigarette in a couple of seconds, they could go to a parking lot. There are parking lots behind all these streets. Um, finally, I would point out that uh, there's been a lot of talk and concern, understandably, about enforcement or enforceability. Uh, if this is approved, we have signs through Vermont New Directions that could be put around town indicating that this is a now a, a non-smoking area. We appreciate your, con your uh, cooperation and also directing people to areas where they can smoke. Uh, besides that, there's been concern about uh, butts. There would be more butts in parking lots instead of on the streets now. We have clarified since then that uh, trash tramps not only collects, they don't restrict their collection of butts to the, uh, the sidewalks, they, they do go to parking lots. And they have also said that they can put these butt receptacles in parking lots if, the, if an ordinance is enacted. I just want to close quickly by saying that I myself am an ex-smoker. And I had a great deal of difficulty smoking. Uh, I, I was smoking, quitting smoking many years ago. So if anyone empathizes with smokers and what they go through, I think it's myself. On the other hand, as already indicated, they are, frankly, in the minority. The majority, 83%, are non-smokers. With all the sympathy that has been expressed toward, uh, toward smokers, which I don't disagree with, I've heard nothing so far about the effect on non-smokers. People like me who have developed an acute allergy after I stopped smoking to smoking, the remarkable number of asthma sufferers who signed this petition was greatly surprised me, and also the number of parents who said they are shopping less during peak hours in Montpelier because they don't want their children exposed to smoke. Uh, those of you who got my email, uh, this is redundant, I'm sure, for all of you. So I'm sorry if it's been a little boring or repetitious. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
I'm Ann Gilbert, and I'm the director of Central Vermont New Directions, which is a substance abuse prevention coalition here in Montpelier, but we cover all of Washington County. And uh, we've been in existence since 1998. And I want to say thank you to Ron, who's been our key volunteer, who has really gone above and beyond on this um, project. Um, so the butt litter has been a real issue in Montpelier that came up as a concern in the past and we've been addressing it with these sidewalk butlers which we purchased and the trash tramps have been a great partner. Now they are cleaning up butt litter every Tuesday afternoon for one hour and in that amount of time we thought it was still the old number of 2,000 butts each week but it's now closer to 4,000 cigarette butts each week. So in a one hour time, they're, they're cleaning them up and then within another week, they're accumulating again. This, yes? Sorry, uh, can you give me a sense of how long that change took from 2,000 a week to 4,000 a week? When, when did you start measuring? Um, well, I was still going with the old numbers that I had gotten I a year and a half ago. Yeah but there's been an increase in the number of smoking. Now, we've also increased the number of the sidewalk butlers. They get emptied once a month. And since more have been added, the number of butts in them has tripled, but they're not as full as the sidewalks, the tree grates, the streets. And so we're, in, we're, we're really concerned about a number of environmental issues. Um, one is the sidewalks and the streets going into the river. There's no filter there that filters them out if they go down a storm drain. They're going into the water. And, um, and then the secondhand smoke, which um, Matt talked about and Jenny as well. 7,000 chemicals and um, 70 of them have, are known to cause cancer. There are so many fine particles from the mainstream mainstream smoke that's being inhaled by a smoker and then exhaled, and even more off of the side stream smoke that comes off the burning end of a cigarette. Um, and so we're worried about that. We already have a number of places that are smoke free. And so with parklets and parks and the state house lawn and around the school and areas around the municipal buildings, we'd really like to be able to have families be able to breathe clean air and navigate the whole downtown, going from one place to another without having to go through um, a, a cloud, whether it's small or large, however many people are congregating there. And so that's why we're really proposing, you know, the, the downtown area of State Street and Main Street, and then especially around the library. Now, Ginny had um, offered a suggestion that some places are uh, increasing the perimeter around the parks that they already have in place. The town of Springfield, Vermont, has increased the distance around their library because there's so many children there and families there. And so they've allowed um, a 175 foot uh, perimeter uh, um, extension along the sidewalk on either side of their library and any churches and retailers can also contact City Council and say we'd like to put up a sign that includes um, the front of our building so that it increases the area so there's a um, uh, more of a lane for people to be able to navigate their downtown. You know I forgot something just to close, mm -hmm. it's sort of ceremonial. I hear my percent. I'm the petitions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Yeah, and um, we were at the Mountaineers game last night, raising awareness of the dangers of secondhand smoke. And there were even a few more people who signed it, including a couple of non, a couple of so it's more smokers. Than so yes. it is a little bit more. Yeah. So. Probably. <laughs> Never mind. I was going to say, do you want to go back to count them? Or? Oh, yes. So we work closely. Well, you can count them. Okay. We, learn, we work closely with the Vermont Department of Health. And our job is really to raise public awareness and community education about public health issues around all substances. And tobacco um, is certainly a very difficult substance. It's highly addictive. And um, so we're bringing you this information so that we can be a community partner. We can help with signage, model ordinances, um, communication to the public, 
um, when this happened at um, the Church Street Marketplace, um, it was, uh, you know, a real team effort, and they have a lot of flags and signage up, and they're not, it's not about issuing tickets, it's just about raising awareness about um, how, how to be, uh, how, to, how, to, how to allow everybody to be able to breathe clean air. Thank okay. you. Uh, Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry to go on. <laughs> she just reminded me of a point that I was in touch with the police department at, uh, in Burlington, and they sent me a report over a nearly three-year period indicated in three years they issued a total of 26 summons, which is a, a little, just slightly more than eight per year, which is, does not seem very much at all. So the enforceability issue uh, on that basis does not seem like would be so serious. Okay, so at this point, um, if there are members of the public who would like to come up and comment. Uh, so if you would come up and say your name, uh, your street, where you, where you live, and, um, and try to keep it to two minutes or less, and Donna, you're gonna help us with timing. Is and Donna, you're good to help us with timing. Great, thank you so much. Hi, my name is uh, Lawrence Seiler. I'm a community advocate as well as a community producer for Orca Media. Uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife is not here, my wife and I host a television program for people with special needs called Able and On Air. And, um, is it on? Oh, is it on? I think it's, it's on. on. Step it up a little bit. And uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes. And uh, New Directions, who I'm here supporting tonight, uh, was on uh, that uh, on my television program, which can be seen on orcamedia.net. But the reason why I'm here uh, as a community advocate, um, um, uh, I live at uh, Pioneer Apartments on Main Street with my wife, and it's going to be smoke-free soon. But uh, my wife, being an asthma sufferer, uh, it's extremely important for this to pass, uh, as well as uh, smoking can cause birth defects, uh, which is extremely bad, and uh, it needs, I mean, if we can make all of Vermont smoke-free, uh, you know, that would be the ultimate goal or the entire world, but hopefully we can start with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, bump somebody but mm -hmm. my name is Susan Abdo Banfield and I just want to tell you a little story it happened last Saturday so it's very recent so it was one of my I don't go to the the farmers market every Saturday but I decided it was a beautiful day so I went to the farmers market just as I was walking into the farmers market there was a person sitting on a bench with a cigarette and I saw a waft of smoke just go. I was able to move out of the way, but a small child that was probably between the ages of one and a half and two and a half, I would guess, could not walk out of the way. And so I saw that, that little cloud of smoke land on that child. And so I am here today because I think that one of the most honorable missions of our government is to take care of our most vulnerable citizens. And that little child is a citizen, and that little child deserves to grow up without smoke around, I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl really, but around that child. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Mary Rose Doherty. And I'm um, advised on the advisory board for Central Vermont New Directions Coalition. And uh, some of the points that have already been made, um, I'm going to state again. Uh, and basically, I became aware of the secondhand smoke dangers about uh, eight years ago when I was taking a class uh, through CCV. Um, Passive smoking causes cancer in non-smokers. As has been stated, there is at least 70 chemicals in secondhand smoking that cause cancer. 12 cancers have been identified to cause cancer in adults and in children. And there's no safe level of exposure for secondhand smoke. And just anecdotally, um, 
I know for myself, I haven't been diagnosed, but anytime I pass someone who has been smoking on the street, and it's just those seconds when you're in passing, I feel the effects of the secondhand smoke. Um, so people with allergies, active intolerance, or asthma are, smoke, are suffering from the, um, just in passing. And uh, another point that I wanted to mention, when Ann was speaking, she brought up some of the effects of um, the presence of these butts. And I read something recently, so I looked it up again. It takes from 18 months to 10 years for cigarettes to decompose in the environment. So they're also affecting, it's also affecting our environment, so the, the health of our mother earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ian Quinlan. Um, while I admire all of the actions that all of you take, um, I do want to make aware that um, while very scary sounding, uh, many of the facts that are being presented about the negativity of secondhand smoke are greatly, exa greatly exaggerated. Um, there is no conclusive scientific study outside of people with intolerance, asthma, or other conditions that may affect their public health. Uh, that affects that any amount of cigarettes uh, by second pan smoke in open air poses any significant uh, risk to the public, any more so than the cars that we allow to drive and park here in town. Um, this is really about civil liberties. And while as a smoker, I do have concerns of the environment, I do have concerns about the health and wellness of our public. Uh, but I do encourage that we work together rather than opposed so that we can come up with some very common sense and uh, equitable ways of dealing with this problem in a way that doesn't affect the civil liberties and the rights of people because this is a very slippery slope that we have and if we start legislating behavior and choices that we are allowed to make as citizens of this country, then we really turn a corner into some very dark paths that could be opened up for others to impose things upon you which you may you might not enjoy. I do think that we are people who are civil, who are able to work together, who can be adults and work out a common, uh, common sense solution to these problems. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that's what we're proposing. Hi. My name is Linda Quinlan. And um, to me, this is an issue more of civil liberties than smoking or non-smoking. I find that the left uses this the way the right uses this. And um, my feeling is that, you know, the, the right uses abortion and they, want it, they can't get rid of it. So they limit, 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 limit until virtually nobody can get an abortion. And I find that the left uses this for the same reason. Limit, limit, limit. If you don't want smoking, make it illegal. Um, if you can't pass an abortion, you know, make it illegal. Don't try to limit people's civil rights. And I also, um, I, you know, I just feel like, you know, I'm allergic to perfume. I'm allergic to deodorant. Are we gonna stop people from wearing deodorant downtown? Or eating a peanut butter sandwich because someone is allergic to peanut butter? I just think this is a civil liberties issue. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sam Markowitz, and I'm at 147 Berlin Street. Uh, first thing I want to say is I believe that you're all probably aware, as people involved in legislation, that almost all legislation, as well as almost all court precedents, are regarding legislating human behavior. So please don't fall for that argument. Um, it's always a balance of whether the human behavior does harm or not. Cigarette smoke does harm to the majority of people. Um, I have a lot of empathy for cigarette smokers and nothing against them. I will just tell you as somebody who doesn't have a car and rides my bike or runs or walks everywhere that I hold my breath for about three quarters of the time that I'm out in Montpelier. I do not like that and it brings me back to the 1980s when I was in Manhattan and did that. Um, the other thing that I would like to talk about is the responsibility that I see for government is a fiscal responsibility is a big part of this. And cigarette smoke has been widely shown to be one of the top health issues in our country 
So as a fiscal responsibility, please consider that you could have a uh, great benefit to public health issues. Um, and uh, finally, I would like to advocate also, I'm a business coach, and uh, I cannot see how you could enact this without allowing Charlie O's to have smokers outside because it would seriously impact their business and I'm not speaking on behalf of them. I just want to put that out there. But other than that, I think it's a very good uh, proposal and it would help in a harm reduction way too because uh, it would allow for there to be defined areas where people were smoking where they could get information about quitting and help with quitting. So I don't really advocate it as far as the enforcement side of giving tickets or something like that, but there's an opportunity certainly to talk to many of the smokers who want help with smoking uh, to quit just like any other drug. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Yvonne Bob. I live in Montpelier, and I own a business on Langdon Street in Montpelier. I want to preface what I'm saying um, by, by my statement by saying that I think smoking is one of the stupidest things that human beings do to themselves. I've had multiple relatives get sick and die from cancer-related, smoking-related diseases. Um, that said, as a business owner in town, I am opposed to this ban. I think it would be bad for businesses we're hopefully going to have a new hotel in town soon. And what are the chances? Some, some of those people are going to say, well, we can't smoke downtown. Like, that's something against coming to Montpelier. It doesn't feel welcoming. It feels alienating. Um, there's also, as somebody said, just said about Charlio's, there are other restaurants and bars. I'm surprised to see none of those owners here to say, this is, how is this going to affect our business? Because people are going to drink and then go outside to have a smoke. And also, I noticed the non-smoking area does not include Langdon Street, where my business is. So am I going to have everybody from Three Penny coming around the corner smoking on my street? The, right now, the amount of smoke there is minimal. I can deal with it. The guys across the street at Langdon Street Tavern, sometimes it blows into my door in the summer. I don't like it, but it's a little bit. I grew up in a smoking household the first 19 years of my life. I worked in restaurants for years when smoking was still legal in restaurants. My lungs are in pretty good shape. Um, it, you know, I know secondhand smoke is not good, but it's not the same as being a smoker. But I really think that this is a bad precedent to send for Montpelier when there are a lot of people who already see Montpelier as kind of this elitist town. And I think that that, as a business owner, sends a really bad message Good evening. Hi, I'm Jessa Barnard, and this is Skyler, and we live on Bailey Avenue. And Skyler just finished first grade at Union, and I am here. We are here because of Skyler's interest in this issue. We got a message um, sent to the, some of the parents at Union, and I told Skyler about it. And every couple days after that, he was asking when this meeting was and if we could come. Um, he decided he wanted me to share his, his thoughts on it, which are that he thinks this should be approved because he doesn't like seeing the cigarette butts on the streets and because it's not healthy to be smoking or around cigarette smoke and because he has asthma and when he is around cigarette smoke, it um, makes it worse for him. We were actually just eating dinner outside a couple nights ago and somebody sat down and started smoking a few feet away from him just as he was getting over a cold and it um, made him cough more. And so we uh, both are here in support and um, Okay, that's what we wanted to share. Thank you. Hi, I don't remember who I am. John Odom. Um, I'm just down here because I don't want this to be seen in any kind of way in my official capacity. I've done this before. Um, so just really briefly, um, well, let's see. I was I have not always been the the middle class Vermont family man that you all see before you. Um, actually. Uh, what, 45 years ago, I was a working class Kentucky hillbilly. Of course, in Kentucky, smoking is a sacrament. So uh, having said that, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to get misunderstood for what I'm about to say. And what I want to say is not in opposition or for or against this particular issue. I trust you all to make the right decision. I love you. You're great. But I just hope folks will bear in mind that 
you know, we just closed down, or, or not we, but the, just across the street, the Bottle Redemption Place just closed down. Um, we're talking about, and I have a feeling, are likely to approve, uh, a, you know, a smoke ban downtown. As we've heard, these are both things that disproportionately affect working class people. And I just want urge folks to be cognizant that there could be a message being sent that could be that could hit people kind of hard. And I hope whatever you do now, there'll be a there'll be a, a redoubled commitment to making sure that Montpelier is, is very clearly made open to folks from all socioeconomic strata. And so that I can feel that, you know, you know here I, I raise my kids, great way to raise my kids. I want to make sure that the five-year-old Kentucky hillbilly kid that I was would also be very clear to be welcome here. Too. Thank you. May I respond to two? Um, uh, very Something briefly, and then I would like to have a council-oriented discussion, unless there's more comments from the public. Very brief, you want to okay. okay. There are two things that I would uh, I'd appreciate the opportunity to respond to. One is what, what John Odom just said. I would remind you that this is a very small area that we're requesting. It's only four streets, and they're not very long streets. So whether that would be perceived just because of the small area as uh, being not, not welcoming, I'm not sure. Somebody mentioned about uh, tourists coming, and they may not come as, as, as much as as they did in the past if they know it's no smoking. I am a volunteer tour guide at the uh, State House during the, tour, during the tourist season. So uh, thinking about this, I decided to count the exact number of visitors that we had last year and the number from Quebec, because Quebec has been cited as a place where a lot of tourists come and almost all of them smoke. The figures are as such, the total number for the entire season was 10,970. Of those, the people from Quebec was 185. That's 1.68% of people coming from Quebec, whereas I said, they do have a high rate of smoking. Uh, most of those people, after they um, uh, finished their tours, asked me if there was some place they could eat. Uh, and I told them, so it's not just that they're coming to the State House and they're not going to other parts of Montpelier. So in terms of Quebec as one example, and I think that might be indicative of other places where people uh, smoke more than others, it does not seem to have that great an effect. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, I'd love to hear some comments from the council about what your desire is to do. Now, so one possibility, um, uh, is that we, um, you know, move forward with the proposal as it's set forward before us. Um, if that's not what you all want to do, then I would love to um, not get into great detail about, um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's not this proposal, um, I would love to maybe lay out options um, and then turn it either back over to this group or to, you know, if there's members of the council or of the public that would like to uh, to continue to work on this and hammer out something to come back, that's fine. Um, but again, I want to avoid get, like trying to iron out all the nitty gritty here in, during this meeting. Um, does that sound like an okay plan, team? Okay, so first of all, where are you at? What are you thinking? Oh, I just wanted to clarify one thing that was said earlier, which was that um, the cigarette butts go into our storm drains and directly into the river. And I know from our tour of the wastewater treatment or wastewater recovery facility that actually, um, because we have this combined sewer overflow system, uh, unless there's a massive, massive rainstorm, all of that water in the st storm drains is actually going to the city treatment plant and getting treated. So I just wanted to correct that misperception before we moved any further. Am, I'm not correct? You're giving it's me a wince. Sort of, <laughs> sort of some. <laughs> we do have separated storm drains that go direct to the city, but some of those that go in, some, some go to the okay. river, some don't. So some, all right. <laughs> yes, Ashley. So I met um, with a couple of folks, and um, in principle, I agree. And I think I raised some of the very issues that a few folks here hit on. Um, not so much from a civil liberties perspective, but more so from an equity perspective. Um, and one of the things it is I'm cold. sorry, Ashley, I'm trying to, I'm to can you, you agree with what? I agree in principle <laughs> with not allowing smoking in okay. certain okay. areas. But it's more of an equity concern uh, for me that this, um, 
dispro disproportionately impacts um, many of our downtown workers, and I and I raise these very issues. So it gets cold in the winter time. It rains a whole bunch here, um, and there's no place where someone could go that is close within reason that is sheltered uh, to smoke. And that's one of the things that I had raised. So that I don't think this is anything that that I'm surprising anyone with that I that I met with. Um, and so I guess I'd like to see a plan. Um, for that, and, and as it as it is, um, I don't feel comfortable with it as as a council member. Um, I fear the message that that sends to a lot of people about Montpelier. I think Montpelier. Um, has a little bit of work to do to be very welcoming to everyone who lives here. Um, and and I think that there are ways that we could enact a, a, a policy like this. I just don't see right now sort of saying, well, you can just go elsewhere and be unsheltered. And um, you know whether it's winter, spring, summer, or fall, that just falls a little flat to me. So if we could find a way to address that, um, I might be more willing to support it. Um, there there is a plan in progress. I can give you details if you're interested. And it was also in the email that I sent you. I, I did see it in the email, but no, it, it didn't come up here. And I feel as a council member, it's, it's incumbent upon me to, to raise my issues so that the community knows um, where the council is at and what the city is doing to address and, this. And we have been thinking about that and talking about that. But I, I will point out that currently, there are no sheltered places. It's it's the sidewalks and the benches, which are also not sheltered. Well, you can be under under awnings, for example, on sidewalks in certain businesses, yeah. outside yeah. of bars, yeah, things right. like that, and and Charlios. Um, we did receive the council. I believe all of us received an email from Three Penny. Um, Yvonne mentioned. Um, Langdon Street Tavern um, and a couple of other places. I know Langdon Street Tavern is not covered by this, but um, it would seem that a blanket prohibition on that would impact some local businesses that we value because I think they add a lot to our sort of downtown culture uh, and experience. Thanks. Regarding the possibility of a, a shelter, we've been in talks with uh, Bethany Church. They were thinking about building one anyway because they said 100% of their homeless people who they had a shelter for last year smoke. And the, the uh, smoke comes in on their breasts when they come. Or if, if the door is open, the smoke comes in. So they had thought before we even thought of it of building a shelter themselves. I pointed out to them that if we cooperated on that, we could most likely get a grant. Or Joyce said that you could build a shelter in just one parking space. It would cost about $8,000. So we're a 501C. We could get a grant for them so that they would not have to pay anything for the shelter. The only problem is that their board of directors has not yet decided whether to renew that uh, shelter next year. And until they make that decision, we can't move forward. Okay, other thoughts, Jack? Go ahead. I think other people are ahead of me. Doesn't matter. Okay, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would say I'm more or less with Ashley. Uh, I want to thank all of you for the hard work that you've done uh, because I really appreciate seeing it. And I, I am. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I excuse me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's right. better. Thank okay. You. So I, I was saying I want to thank the the people who have presented. Uh, I really appreciate the work, and I think that it's it's been. Um, very useful, all of the data and the arguments um, presented so far. I'm not perfectly ready to support it yet. Uh, I like the limited uh, area. Um, that does m seem like it uh, mitigates some of the, the uh, civil liberties concerns that people brought up. Um, and I also like the idea of uh, before we move, uh, hearing more from specifically uh, Three Penny and Charlie O's, because when I sketched out my little map of the four streets and thought about who smokes where, I think right in front of Charlie O's and right in front of Three Penny is going to be 90% of, of the cigarettes affected by this. Um, so I would say. Uh, I also want to uh, appreciate the, the trash tramps who got brought up and the butlers. Uh, both of those things uh, have made a noticeable difference just while I've been here. So, We've been in discussion, incidentally, about the possibility of uh, only continuing the okay. no smoking area. Ron, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, I'm going to ask Jack to go, and then you can share. Okay. Okay. I 
should start by saying I hate cigarettes and cigarette smoking, and I hate the companies that uh, make cigarettes. But uh, I am very concerned about the class impacts of an ordinance prohibiting uh, outdoor smoking downtown. It's very clear that the predominant uh, group that uh, smoke cigarettes in our society now are people of lower socioeconomic status. And as others have said, I think telling, passing this ordinance is telling people, we don't want you here in Montpelier. You don't belong here. And I think that's really problematic. I think there are other some, there are some other issues. I think there is reason to be skeptical about the health claims about open air, secondhand smoke. Um, I think there are some, uh, there might be some more things we could do about smoking cessation and prevention efforts, which I would like to see. Um, we just, uh, approved a contract for um, trash barrel collection for downtown and I'd be interested in seeing if it would be feasible to add the uh, cigarette butt receptacles to that in uh, future contracts because it seems as though maybe we need a lot there are 15 in downtown now it seems like maybe we could use need a lot more uh, than that um, I'm concerned about enforcement and how much that would have the potential for um, diverting from other police activities and to the suggestion of uh, having people get off the sidewalks and smoke in the uh, parking lots uh, I have some real safety concerns about that because people drive kind of crazy in parking lots and <laughs> so I, I think that Cigarette smoking is a scourge, but I think that it's very, I'm re reluctant to adopt an ordinance prohibiting it downtown. Connor. Um, well, I'm well, sorry. Oops. I was going to let Ron speak. Did you oh, want to sure. jump in? Oh, well, regarding Charlie O's and the other bars, but there's been just some discussion among us that hasn't yet been uh, resolved. We haven't come to any decision, but we were thinking about part of the proposal would be that after 8.30, oh, uh, smoking would be allowed in all these these four streets that we're hoping to restrict it. Thank you. Yep, go ahead, Connor. I uh, did want to start by saying uh, thank you to New Directions. You, you do such great work in the city and, and the county, and uh, I, I think you're coming in with a lot of heart with this proposal. I'm extremely sympathetic as somebody who has asthma myself and has felt some of the effects. Uh, so there's no question how well intended this is. Um, I, I did spend a few hours over the course of the last week um, just doing my own survey with smokers in the community. Um, I, I'd stand with them and uh, I, I, I think I was surprised to see the level of emotion over this issue with them. And I, I, the perception I got was, um, and it was coming from them, and I, I think it was genuine, that this was sort of a classist uh, proposal that was a bit draconian and would make them feel unwelcome in their own communities. Um, and that struck me as just something very real that needed to be addressed, uh, you know, before going much further. Um, you know, I spoke to some of the business owners that would be uh, most affected by this, mostly the bars. And, uh, you know, to, to a business, they said this would have a real and immediate impact on them and possibly create an unlevel playing field in that if you are a business like Charlie O's, um, you know, you do have a smoking area in the back there, where as Langdon Street Tavern would not, you know. Uh, so that may weigh into people's decisions. Uh, as far as the enforceability, I, I do know our police force is at capacity, and I, I know this would draw a, a, a bit of a public relations campaign to it if we did pass an ordinance. Um, I think there are other ways of raising awareness, and I personally would be willing to invest in those uh, ways to do that. Um, but I, I, I think at the moment I'm not quite there on this proposal but I, I wouldn't want to necessarily close the door on the conversation of how we can look at ways to address this. But I, I do want to thank you so much. I'll try to be really brief because I'm definitely odd person out. And I think because of my age, I went through the civil rights argument when we took it out of restaurants. I heard the bars were going to just be broke because we took cigarettes out of bars. So I'm not trying to uh, infringe on anyone's civil rights. I'm trying to improve health conditions. And I think we do have to be 
multi-prong to help people have alternatives, to be supportive. And number one, that we are finding cigarette butts outside of the butlers. So we really have got to work and say, okay, smokers, work with us. Use the butlers. So then we don't have the issue not only of the smoke, but of the butts. So I would like to see us continue to work on this, even if it's not a straightforward ordinance, but to do something so that we have less cigarette butts, at the very least, on our streets and sidewalks and parking lots, and that we don't just push it aside, that we actually become active and do something with this information. Thank you, Donna. Unless, Rosie, you haven't gotten a chance to I'm speak. If, if you actually want. articulated my concerns really well. Um, and it's not that I would never agree to something like this, but I think there's some real issues that I haven't seen addressed. And I want to see, wh where do we want people to smoke? And I don't think that that's been well articulated other than, oh, in the parking lots. And frankly, I think it's going to happen in people's cars and I don't, and maybe inside. And I don't know that um, people surreptitiously smoking inside where they're not supposed to be or in their cars where they're exposing their children um, or others or themselves um, is potentially the best outcome. So I think that there's more work to do here in determining where do we want people to go? And I wonder if we can maybe take more of a carrot than a stick approach in terms of um, adding more uh, receptacles. And I have heard from a number of folks that they feel like there aren't enough. Um, we heard from city staff that the last one purchased cost $99. So I think that that's a, a thing that the city can afford to do if there aren't grant resources. And it sounds like there may very well be some more grant resources available for that. So um, I would like to kind of start in that from that perspective um, and and move on from there and see what we can do by encouraging the places that it makes sense rather than prohibiting it um, everywhere. So I haven't weighed in yet. So before you go, Ashley, I'm going to take my turn. Um, so I have five things that I want to say. So. Um, one of the so uh, similarly to what has been said, one of the main reasons that I don't support this particular proposal is uh, that it pushes people off of Main Street, um, and that to me presents safety concerns. Um, so if if there was some proposal that didn't push people off the streets, that would be good. Um, Having well, so there, that's one thing. The other thing too that I do worry about is actually the enforceability. Um, you know, you mentioned you know there were eight tickets per year roughly that were cited in Burlington um, that to me actually communicates that a fair number of people are probably smoking on Church Street and don't get a ticket and which tells me that it's a really tough thing to enforce and we have lots of ordinances that we're actually um, trying to go through this year to figure out like well if we can't enforce them either we got to modify them or you know take them ma make them enforceable or take them off the books. Um, so that's uh, my ideal, uh, you know, smoking policy would be enforceable. Um, the there are a couple things about this though that I um, well, um, well one thing about it that I that I do really like is that um, it focused on School Street and Park Ave, in, and it sounded like um, the reason those streets were listed there is because of the proximity to the elementary school, and I appreciate that. I mean, the high school has a huge buffer around it as a space where you can't smoke. Um, Union Elementary does not have quite such a big buffer. Um, so, you know, that's something that, like, if it was just, uh, if it was just Union, you know, I would, uh, or I'm sorry, if it was just uh, Park Ave, I mean, that's something that I would consider um, because of uh, you know, the proximity to the school. Um, you know, there are hundreds of ways to slice this, and it feels like this is not quite the right way, but I agree with Donna that I, you know, there may be another way to slice it that I think make, might make more sense. And, and um, uh, Ron, you even brought one up yourself, you know, about like what if it was just a time limit? Uh, you know, it was between these hours that you couldn't smoke. You know, that's something to think about. Or if it was just around intake vents, or if it was um, not on benches, or if it was, uh, if there were designated designated places or uh, where you could smoke or where you couldn't smoke. I mean, hundreds of ways to to um, to slice it. And so I also hope that we, you know, don't um, uh, let this go entirely, but um, let's just find a, a different um, a different solution. Um, and then, Ginny, you yeah, I, do yeah, something. Yeah, uh, I totally agree that this is not the place to do the slicing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but is there a place? It, I, I don't know what committees or if there are ways that we could, you know, because we, we 
come with something, then a fugitive would come with something else. And I'd rather not do guess and check if we yes. could work together to try and come up with something. Sure. Well, so um, one possibility is that uh, if there's any people, anybody on the council who is interested in working with you all, we could do it that way. Another possibility is that, I mean, if you have a draft, I mean, you can send it to, you, you're welcome to send it to me, and I'm happy to do a little bit of like, just, you know, like, ground true thing about like is this gonna fly um, does this seem like it would s satisfy um, you know this group um, and then you know uh, we can we can do that even just you and I, I mean I'm gonna volunteer myself we can do that um, sort of behind the scenes um, till we, we're at a point where I think we, we have something that might work um, so yeah Something you said is, is actually an idea to just make um, School Street and Park Avenue. That's something I would love to talk about again. Let's save that for another time. Um, it, is there anybody on the council besides, I mean, I'm volunteering myself here, <laughs> um, but um, anybody else up for you know meeting with um, directions? Well, I'm looking at really, you, Donna, because you were... Yeah, well, but I think it's important for people who... <coughs> have objections to it should be on the committee or we keep coming back and the same objections yeah. still appearing. Yeah, so that's fair. That's I fair. would help, but I think we have to have other people. You may want to have a biz business community, maybe a smoker. It strikes me that you the, the committee on the agenda for oh, a bit later might that's a, be. That's a good point. Since that's really, since that seems to be predominantly some of the issues that that we raised, we raised. So later on the agenda, we're going to be talking about the creation of uh, a committee. What do you, what are we going to call it? I think that was pulled. That wasn't pulled. No, no, social it's not and economic justice committee. Um, equality. And equality. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that might be a group that that could interface um, with you all. I could picture that being a topic, for sure. Okay. Great. So for now, I'm assuming no one's going to make. Does anyone? Would you like to make a motion? Yeah. Okay. You, on this. You need a motion on this? No. Well, I was just. That we're going to further study it. Um, okay. I don't think we need. That's a not quite what I meant. Okay. But if you <laughs> I, I, I thought you were gathering consensus. I didn't think you want a motion. Yeah. No. Well, I I was. I she was just opening the floor. Opening the if floor anyone had a motion they wanted to make. Right. Right. Okay. All right, so let's put that on, uh, if we could put this topic on the list of things for that committee right. to look at, that way you have a, um, you know, that would place to interface. That would be okay. great, and I'm going to take myself off of that hot seat. So, um, and I see that there's one person from the back, if you would like to come up and comment, um, and then we're going to move on. Oh, actually, you have to come up and speak because there's people uh, watching on television who otherwise would not be able to hear you. Did you have a fifth thing? Oh, there was a fifth thing, and I didn't say it. So I'm sorry. Um, I liked the idea of more butler receptacles. I've got to figure out how we can make that happen. So you anyway, do that thank you. Through trash camps. They, they got a grant for those. I love it. Let's see yeah. how we can support that. Oh, well, we did. Uh, if you would say your name just, and... Just to add somebody to the committee who was speaking here about the smoking and in favor of the smoking, civil liberties and equity, one of those people might be added to the group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. And what's your name? Deborah Sargent. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. All right. uh, we're going to keep going, though, Ashley. All right, thank you all very much. I appreciate that this is a complicated and, and thank you all. important topic, so thank, thank you. you. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Can we structure this one a little differently? Um, with Council speaking first? Yes, I was actually going to suggest that. Um, so for this next one, um, so all my computer is waking back up here. So the uh, next item is about uh, canine code of conduct, I believe. All right, so their recommendation for um, uh, the code of conduct for dogs in um, Hubbard Park. So, Donna, this was a topic that you uh, wanted to see on the agenda. So, really, what um, the goal of this time is to figure out what is the will of the council um, in terms of 
going back to that committee or um, or not. So uh, I want to start, Donna, with you um, having the floor, and then I want to go to the council members and see where you are at. And depending on where we're at as a council, um, actually not depending, after the council has an op had an opportunity to weigh in, then we'll open it up to the public for comments. Thank you. I was concerned with the letter that was about the same as we'd gotten a year and a half, almost two years ago, from the commission. And I felt like we were asking them to do more signs and other postings and marketing without them really having the budget and personnel to do it. So I wanted to see us to do more than just see this. Uh, somehow by asking it back on the agenda, people felt I was trying to change the kind canine code of conduct, but I, I've been concerned about the relationship between the council and the park commission. Uh, Councillor Kruger has got some ideas of how we could approach that quite differently that I'm open to discuss, and maybe that's the way to resolve this. Uh, I just feel that we wanted things from the park commission that really they don't have the personnel power or finances to do without us giving them that. And are you thinking specifically of signage or? Well, there's, there's signage in the parks that doesn't exist about leashing your dog. There's, uh, there's a fact of not having enough really money and people to market and publicize and educate the public about the co canine code of conduct. So I think there's a two-edged sword. You've got to have really a, a person and staff and material to help really enliven it because we do keep having problems. And so and even themselves, they had six that reported to the police besides others. So I would just like us to give support to this so that it really does reach out and meet the needs of everybody using the park and feeling safe. Uh, Rosie. So um, I thought this was really interesting because the council acted last fall um, because we had received a number of complaints um, from folks who felt that they didn't feel comfortable going into the park, that they didn't feel comfortable bringing their young children into the park, who had um, had uh, uncomfortable interactions that they were not happy about. And so they came to the council. Um, and so we requested that the Parks Commission look at this issue. Um, the Parks Commission is an elected body, um, and that's kind of a unique situation. Um, so the Parks Commission looked at the issue, and their letter back to us says some stuff that they're doing, um, and says that basically they, they feel that the status quo is working, that they don't think that there's an issue. So we have a situation where we've got two different elected bodies in the city of Montpelier, and one was, you know, approached, we were approached by uh, constituents saying that there was a problem, and the other elected body feels like there's not a problem. Um, and so I kind of thought, well, where does the buck stop here? You know, is this, is this our responsibility if something goes wrong um, as the council, or is it the Parks Commission's responsibility? So I went back to the city charter, and the city charter is really clear. Um, it says uh, the, com the Parks Commission shall have charge of the construction, maintenance, and control of all public parks within the city. The term public parks shall not be construed to include recreational fields and playgrounds. So there's our answer. This body is not responsible for this issue, unfortunately, um, because we have folks coming to us to complain about it, and that's what our answer has to be. We are not responsible for this. And I feel very odd as a public official passing the buck to somebody else. I, I want to be able to solve this issue, but it is clearly in our city charter not our responsibility. There is a conflict with that. Just well, and I, so I wanted to continue on because the next part of this is that the city council is responsible for funding the parks. Um, and we have appropriation responsibility. We have two city employed staff members who report to the city manager who are paid out of city funds um, who are responsible for taking care of the parks and, and sort of carrying out the Parks Commission's directives. And so this to me just seems like this is sort of a an awkward situation um, where we're responsible for paying for the maintenance and the control and whatever the, this other elected body wants to do without having the authority according to the charter. Um, and I don't feel comfortable as a counselor um, <laughs> uh, fully suggesting the, the two options here that I see to um, to deal with that, one of which is that we give the Parks Commission, uh, the, the, the city um, vote to uh, amend the charter to give the Parks Commission uh, statutory authority to 
uh, levy funds to, to bond, just as the other elected uh, city body, the um, Cemetery Commission, they have their ability to bond. Um, so when they decide they're going to do something, they can figure out how to fund it. Um, Parks Commission doesn't have that. We have to do that. So that's, that's one option, is that we figure out a way uh, to amend the city charter to give them that. The other option is to um, amend the charter um, so that the, the Parks Commission was no longer an elected body and just like all, all our other city committees was appointed by this council. Um, again, I don't feel comfortable in my position suggesting taking away the authority of another elected body, but I want to put that out there to the public that these are two ways of resolving that issue. And those are the only two ways that I can see right now of resolving that. Perhaps there are others. Um, so I'm not going to suggest that we really take any action tonight other than that funding piece. Um, and Donna has pointed out that there is a, a piece missing here, and that's the signage. Um, and we uh, can pay for signage um, in Hubbard Park, um, displaying the, the canine code of conduct more prominently, as well as in all our other um, public areas, our, our sidewalks, um, all the areas that were affected by the recent ordinance change, those are not yet signed, um, our recreation fields, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the North bike branch. path, <laughs> the bike path and North Branch um, are not yet signed. So um, we can take some action there. And I would suggest that we go ahead and do that and put that signage in place there. Um, so that was my kind of reconciling with this issue um, and how to respond. So. I am not saying that this is a proposal that I am making, but I, I am wondering, and Bill, I think I would probably defer to you on this, um, if the city has the ability to fund the parks, which is what my understanding is the city does have the authority to do, there is always the option, and I am not advocating for this, but putting it out there as another possible way, like the federal government did with speed limits, by saying you can do, like, we're going to fund you if you do X. And I think, for me, I would want signage. I mean, that, that to me is, is at least the thing that seems to, to be the most lacking. And I'm a little disappointed because we had asked that we get some signage to, I, I just, I, I thought that's where we left it, was that we were asking for signs and that didn't happen. But that is another potential way to go about addressing this issue of, like, how do we make this happen as the council when the authority is delegated to the parks. Not saying I'm advocating for that, but it's an option. Doug, Other can things? I just weigh in? Yes, please. So not <laughs> for or against the proposal. <laughs> Um, but there is one other piece, which is that only the council can enact an ordinance. So even though the Parks Commission has the control of the parks, they can only make rules which aren't necessarily enforceable by any way other than saying you're breaking a rule or you're banned. So that's really where, the, I think this was where this came up before. The park said, here's our rules, and then it was, well, if it's going to become a city ordinance, it, it's the council, so that they don't have ordinance making authority. So that's one other area that, even though they're, they have these things. So I think that, so either, you know, to your idea, maybe we could delegate the ordinance making authority for the parks to them, or conversely, that's the way this body keeps the final control. So that's just one other angle. But um, certainly signage is something we can do. And it just also, just quickly, we have ordered signs for downtown and those kind of things. So they're, they're coming. What was that, Bill? I just said we have ordered signs for like the streets and not right. to reflect the new. So I'm, I'm surprised they're not up all yet already. Do we know when those are going to? I'm surprised they're not here now and okay. up. Maybe they're here and just haven't had a chance to be put up. I don't. Is do we know that there is uh, signage at every entrance to Hubbard Park? Oh, this was the signs for the actual must be on leash for the streets and sidewalks and bike paths. This wasn't about not the, the code parks. of conduct. Not the code of conduct. Is there a signage about code of conduct? These are supposed to be the main entrances, yeah. At every entrance? Every entrance? Yep. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, other thoughts or comments? So it sounds like we're getting signs for, for downtown. Not for, the, for downtown, for the, for the other part, the non-Hubbard Park. The non-Hubbard Park. Non-Park right. portion of the ordinance, yes. Uh, yes, Jack. I've gotten more email about this particular topic than <laughs> anything Welcome else since I've been here. And uh, it, uh, 
tells us something about how strongly feel people feel about this. And I'm really only hearing from people who own dogs who feel that their ability to uh, use Hubbard Park in a way that they think they want to is under threat. And I'm struck that the, these two items that we're talking about, the downtown smoking item and this one, are both, both have sort of the same flavor of conflicts between groups of people who have uh, arguably legitimate ways of which they want to use our public space. And uh, you know, the people who want to have their dogs run free in the park I think it makes a lot of sense for the park, for the city to make some provision to enable people to do that. For people who want to be able to walk by themselves and with their children and with their dogs and not have those, not have them or their children be be under threat from from other dogs. I think that's also a, a totally legitimate uh, desire. I have a hard time believing that because there are only six reported incidents that that means the status quo is fine because I know I talk to people and people say well my kids have been knocked over my kids are scared of the dogs in the park my dogs have been attacked I don't go to Hubbard Park anymore because of uh, other dogs that uh, people do not control, even though they uh, they think they're controlling them. And so I don't think the status quo is working for the community as a whole. I'm not sure what uh, the right solution is, but I think there should be at least some provision for people to have their dogs loose. And I think there should be opportunities for people to use the parks without being uh, afraid of having uh, of being of encountering dogs that uh, might pose a threat to them because you don't know you're out in public you see a dog uh, that's that's not on a leash no matter what the owner thinks about that dog you do not know if you're not the owner of that dog whether that dog is going to attack you or not you don't know if that dog is a threat or not and no amount of the owner saying, oh, don't worry, he, she wouldn't hurt a fly, is, uh, is, is going to help. And so I think we need to keep working on this um, and pro working on providing a way to give, give both people a reasonable, both interests a reasonable opportunity to get what they want, whether that's physical separation or whether it's uh, scheduling. I think there are ways to do it, and I'm not sure what they are, but uh, I think we need to keep working on this. So uh, my instinct here is that if, there are, if there's others who uh, would like to keep working on it, better, better say so now. Um, Otherwise, it seems like there's arguably no action to be taken at this point. Is that, would you more or less agree? Anybody else want to take up, um, you know, continuing to work on it? Okay. We're going to move on then. Um, if there oh, are people who would like to comment, um, now is the time. So, um, and but it looks like we're not likely to take any action tonight. Um, so if you want to um, see something, please do. You've got about two minutes, and Donna's going to help us with timing. All right. Say my name again, Sam Markowitz, 147 Berlin Street. Um, city manager is here. City council is here. Mayor is here. You all hold the vision. That's part, a big part of your job is to hold the vision for the city. The Parks Commission, I don't consider that to be a part of their job. I believe that the right thing for you to do, having heard what you reported, is to you all make the decisions. And you hold the purse. And you, uh, you, you basically uh, 
where there are vision questions that you should be responsible for that. And this is a major vision question for me. Having moved here three years ago from out of state and deciding with my wonderful partner we're here for the rest of our lives, well, when I step, set foot in this town, a big part of why I decided to move here is because I went for a run in Hubbard Park. Um, it's beautiful. It's an incredible asset. And I might add that one of the best things that you all could do for this, having moved from California and gone through all of the rigmarole that took years to get multi-use trails that included horses, dogs off of leashes, mountain bikes, walkers, joggers, is if you opened Hubbard Park as a multi-use place, it would be democracy in action and most of these problems would go away. And it would be one of those things that seems like it's going to be a blank storm, but it won't. Once you do it, it will be fine. And people will learn how to get along in this situation if it's multi-use, and it will create a major, major asset to attract people as tourists and as people who want to move into the city more. Thank you. I moved here eight years ago from Portland, Oregon. There are a lot of parks there, a lot more parks than here, and almost every one of them has an enclosed area, quite a large area, where the dogs can romp and play with other dogs, unleashed. I love dogs. I feel very bad when I think that they have to be leashed all the time. However, I am certainly cognizant of the, uh, the danger, the possible danger to children. A solution, uh, I think there's plenty of room in Hubbard Park for at least one dog playground that would be enclosed. I used to watch the dogs there and they were having a fabulous time running around and playing with each other. That seems to me like sort of a logical uh, solution. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dan Dickerson and I'm on the Parks Commission. Um, so I'm having trouble figuring out where I'm gonna start with this. Um, I guess, from what I've heard from council members, I am very concerned. Yeah, you can take the mic off and put it on the next level. Would it be possible to give him a little more than two minutes just hearing from the sure. park commission? Yes. I, I think if, if you helpful. don't mind, if I could sit no, down and that way you can bounce questions. Maybe I should have done this at the beginning. Um, so, I guess the, the first thing I want to say is. The direction, at least my impression of the direction that was given to us, um, was that we were to have, you know, a discussion about canine challenges, issues, questions in Hubbard Park. Um, it wasn't necessarily a direction to add signage or do this or do that, but to say, to have a discussion of, um, you know, are there issues? How can we address them? Um, and I think the letter does convey that. Um, we we came up with some sort of policy ideas that could be done by us, although I will say that we are budget challenged and that opens another bag of worms that Councilwoman Kruger brought up. Um, but we laid out those policy provisions and at the bottom we said, you know, uh, we would strongly urge the city council to consider the creation of a, of, we called them the canine recreation areas, um, just because frankly it's not something that we have the resources to manage if, if one is created. Um, and uh, you know, and there were there were a few of us that really weren't in favor of, of anything like that at all, and there were a few of us that were, and that was the back and forth. And so we said, consider it. Um, so that was that. So I so I will say that uh, you know, my impression was that we weren't directed to to take action. We were directed to have a conversation, albeit the conversation probably took longer than it should have because I think this was back in October. Um, but we, we presented you with a letter, um, and, and we are willing to act on, on those things. And you know, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to you know, hear what you have to say and take it back to the Parks Commission at our next meeting. Um, so I'll, I'll leave my comments at that, and I'll happily take questions. What I've gathered is that our, generally speaking, our reaction to that letter is, it's fine. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> that works. It was, uh, I don't know. That's... I, yeah. That's not necessarily I what I my, got my concern about it is that the council was hearing up until last fall when we asked you to do that, we were hearing complaints. And the letter gave me the impression that you weren't hearing the complaints. So I want to be able to, in the future, when we get the complaints, I would like to direct folks to you. And if you feel like they raise to a level of a serious problem, yes. 
that you would then take decisive action and do something about it. Yes, um, I would love that. And I, I, you know, I think maybe it's a, it's a possibility that people just don't know the Parks Commission exists. I think it's a very strong possibility. <laughs> so I would love for all of you know, and, and those of you out there, if, if you hear from people that are having problems with canines in, in Hubbard Park or North Branch or any of the parks, please, please communicate with the Parks Commission. Um, and you know, if, if we just see a landslide of, of people that have issues, then we will take action. Um, what that action would be, I guess, would be up in the air, but we'll we'll, we're not gonna ignore this. Okay. Awesome, thank you very much. There you go. Very good. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Akulajic, live on Hubbard Park Drive, which by its very name is right next to the park. And I've been a resident for since 1986. I walk with my dog, Star, twice a day in the park. I've done so for 11 years. Lately, uh, we've done at least two miles a day, morning and afternoon combined. I have witnessed many encounters with folks in the park, both runners and other dog owners and non-dog owners. You can do the math. If I've been in the park, let's say 350 days of the year, because I do go on vacation, twice a day, that's 700 visits to the park. I'm probably gonna give you an estimate of five encounters that I see that I'm participating in or visualizing other people encountering me or others each time. So that's about, let's say 33,000. We'll round it down, because it's 3,500. Therefore, I can tell you with certainty that the canine code of conduct is working, and it's working well. And the number of encounters where you have a problem, out of all of those that I've seen, is about three maybe in a year, if that many, okay? The canine code of conduct, people are paying attention to it. I have people that encounter me on the trail. My dog is up on the hillside a little bit, so she's away from me, so they don't see that I have a dog with me. I see her, but they don't see it. They immediately put their dog on a leash because they see they're coming up against a person that doesn't have a dog. It is working, it happens many times. And so I think the Park Commission should get a lot of, a lot of respect and a lot of, of pre credit for, for this canine code of conduct. It is working. It's, it's something that's not gonna be perfect. You're gonna have clueless owners out there. And I wrote this in my email to all of you. But you can't treat everybody because of a few clueless types. You have to go and force or be, make those people accountable. I just want to close by saying that the members of the Park Commission are basically hardworking volunteers who ran for office and were elected by the voters in the city, all the voters in the city that, that showed up to vote. In my estimation, having been to several monthly meetings over the years, they care deeply about Hubbard Park. Their proposal for future improvements in Hubbard Park is reasonable, and it deserves your endorsement, which I think we just heard you give it. They have a good track record for being fair, cognizant of all park users, and should not be second-guessed. Their job, taking on the benefit of all residents in the city, is hard enough, and I thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Marilyn Mode. I live on Summer Street, and um, I have done some statistics for you all, as usual, and maybe you could pass them down. Do try to keep it to two minutes. I am going to. No, okay, good. Walk time count, I hope. Um, <laughs> and then, by the way, Dear public, I would like to move on <laughs> after, after this. Okay. Um, and so okay, fine. Yeah. I did an analysis of those incidents reported to the police. And you can see the breakdown. Um, and there have been no reports since the first of the year in Hubbard Park. So I would ask all of you to reread the, the ordinance because there already is a solution or a process to deal with naughty dogs. And there is 
a naughty dog panel that meets with restorative justice uh, with the um, community justice team. And we get referrals from, um, from the police department. And I know the police department is going through every complaint to see if it, you know, should go to, to the criminal justice or the community justice team. And then there is even the doggy death panel, which deals with issues where dogs have, um, you know, hurt another dog or hurt a person. And it's, it's very thorough. Now, I know, Donna, you're concerned that preventing the next catastrophe. Well, I'd like to know where the first catastrophe was. Um, because, I, I mean, this is working, folks. It really is. And as far as signage, I would encourage you to not only do uh, dog signage, but also trail signage in the parks. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. And this is our your last public comment, and then we're going to OK. Um, I also want to speak in support of uh, the recommendations that the Parks Commission has made. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I want to speak in support of the recommendations that the Who parks commissioners have made. Oh, Dennis Regal, I live on Town Hill Road. Um, they have been uh, working with this issue uh, since at least 2014. Uh, and with the establishment of the Canine Code of Conduct, uh, things have, I mean, there have been great, vast improvements in the park. Uh, the Canine Code of Conduct took almost a year to uh, get finalized, and it was uh, it was a, a very um, very inclusive and um, extraordinary process. Um, and what so the these people, the, these parks commissioners, have been dealing with this, um, and uh, I think they are the ones who are closest to whatever problems might exist, um, and. Why would you not? Why would you try to second guess them? Actually, but I want to also say that um, there has now been in place this reporting system, which is handled by the Mont Montpelier Police Department. So, if you have, if you have an issue, a dog issue, if you're a user, a park user, and you have a dog issue, um, you make a report to the police department. The police department will then investigate it and make whatever, uh, whatever needs to be, be done, you know, give a citation or dismiss it or whatever. And the, the beauty of that is they have a database and we are no longer, the parks commissioners or you or anyone else who cares about this issue, no longer relies on anecdotal evidence, anecdotal stories. Um, <laughs> so, the, the, and this is a very important point because out of the six incidents that were mentioned in the in the letter from the Parks Commission, none of them occurred in Hubbard Park, not one. And if an issue, if somebody does not report an issue, any reasonable person, you know, should come to the. Uh, I think any reasonable person would agree that then it's a rather insignificant uh, uh, event that happened to them. Um, and in, 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 so it, also in terms of the funding for the park, um, I don't know, the idea of withdrawing city funding from the park, which has been, which has been going on for years and years, in order to do what in the park? To make, you know, to, to do what? <laughs> So, Dennis, I'm, I'm going to make some laws. Right. To make some laws. If you would is, wrap it up the next yeah, little it's bit like, here. It's like just, you know, it's some kind of, it seems so strange and some kind of blackmail. This issue has been litigated over and over. And in fact, it's been like a year, almost a year to the day, when mm -hmm. Article 4, um, which was on the ballot, the special ballot of June, June 20th, 2017, put on by Donna Bate, was uh, failed asked if the question was what is whether dogs should be leashed in Hubbard Park and it failed so you know I think I think you have to you know like some of you have to get on you know look at really what's happening because there's nothing going on in the park that's not being taken care of I think we're well okay thank you 
thing. All right, so we're going to um, move on. Thank you all for your thoughts and comments about that. Um, all right, so the uh, break. tax stabilization ap application. So this is the second public hearing uh, for uh, uh, the Timber Homes Vermont. Any chance of a five minute? Can we? What, we can do this. Can we do this one and then take a break? Sounds good. I would feel really good about that. Um, okay, so uh, I, I'm going to open the public hearing right now. If anyone has comments that they want to make about, um, unless did you have something that you wanted to present? I mean, this is a second public hearing, so theoretically there shouldn't be anything new, right? Um, there, were, there was, there, there was there request for some information. Yes. yes okay. Answer. Sorry. So I'll turn it over to you then. Great. I'll try and be very brief. Okay. See if I know how to work this thing. Sorry. Very low tech. That's great. <laughs> no, it's like that harder because it's low tech. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I'll try and be extra brief. Um, it's really okay. Okay. It's really hurrying. Okay. You take your time. Great, thanks. Will somebody just give me a little wink if I should speed up? Um, I wanted to respond to a few of the counselors' requests for information. Um, I also was thinking of giving a short backstory about who Timber Homes is and our connection to this land, because I think I failed to do that last time, but... Um, sure. Okay. Um, so my name is Shannon McIntyre. I'm a partner at Timber Homes Vermont. Um, we are a construction company that's been in business for 12 years, operating out of our shop in Versher, Vermont, and a small wall tent in Middlesex. Um, our company was founded when the two original owners partnered on a year-long project teaching high school students how to timber frame and building a three-story cow barn for their school in the process. We still do a lot of teaching through workshops that we run ourselves and at building schools around New England. We are committed to high-quality construction with small ecological impact. We work with local loggers and sawyers to produce buildings um, made of as much Vermont-grown material as is reasonable and affordable. We pay all of our employees, including seasonal staff, a living wage. Our lowest paid person this year will make $18 an hour. Um, we bought a piece of land on Route 12 two years ago. Um, so this is a little kind of aerial view of our land. It's in between Pearl Street Motors to the north and Vermont Tree Experts to the south. Um, it's a beautiful piece of land on Route 12. Uh, we now have zoning permission to build a timber framing shop there with an office wing. We've secured a loan from the Cooperative Loan Fund of New England. Um, we are a worker-owned co-op, and because our business structure is set up this way, um, essentially to exist in perpetuity beyond the founders, uh, we were able to secure a loan with much longer terms than traditional banks would have given. Um, we chose to build in Montpelier even though we paid a premium for that land. Uh, and knowing that our taxes will be many times what they are at our Versher shop because of the overwhelming desire of many of our people to be here. Um, besides wanting to live here, we also want to build here. Having a pu public face for our company was another major reason to build on Route 12. Um, much of our work in the past has been clustered in the Upper Valley area around where our current shop is in Versher. Um, and we're excited to be more involved in this community. We've done a number of um, uh, we've made a number of efforts in the past to build for the public at reduced rates in this area just so we could make some connections with people and get our work out there. Um, examples include the sign of the Capital City Grange, which was just a donation, um, design and construction help on the new tuning fork stage in Hubbard Park, uh, and um, part of the North Branch Nature Center. The porch there was a project of ours, and we donated a part of that um, labor. Um, so anyway, just to point out that we really want to see beautiful infrastructure in this city because this is our home. Um, and so I was thinking of just going through the criteria um, for tax stabilization and sort of checking off the boxes and letting you know that, that we qualify. Is that a thing that would be useful? Or should I just respond to, the, there were questions about um, public amenities and... I think you need to go through the checking the boxes. Um, Unless there's... You've seen the, the report we wrote. If it's something that you think that you want to make a case for that's different, then I think you ought to call that out. Okay, great. Well, maybe I will just um, 
pick out the pieces that I think answer questions that counselors had from the last meeting and um, mention a few other things. So um, let's see. Um, all of the level one stuff I think is pretty straightforward. Um, so I think the questions that counselors had were both on criteria for level two tax stabilization. Um, I answered but wanted to clarify the employment question. Um, so just to be totally crystal clear, um, we're, there will be seven new jobs in Montpelier. Um, we had three jobs in Middlesex, so arguably that is only four jobs for the Montpelier area. Um, but it's seven new jobs in Montpelier, and it's a net four new year-round positions in Vermont because we're ha um, a number of our first-year people are moving to Montpelier, uh, but we're replacing all those jobs with people who have roots in that sort of local area. We're trying to keep people where they really want to be. Um, and it's also, uh, because of this new infrastructure, we have the capacity to um, hire six seasonal people. So the sort of like net new jobs in Vermont is for year-round positions and six seasonal jobs. Um, and then the public benefits and amenities question um, that Councillor Kruger brought up is, um, the way I'd like to answer that is I have sort of a list of things that Timber Homes has discussed doing um, that benefit the public. And I don't have um, a fully laid out plan for any of these things, uh, but some of them, we've just been, like, they're sort of givens. We're gonna do this because it makes sense where this piece of land is and who we are as a company. And some of them um, we are interested in doing but, but might need to sort of partner with other groups on. So um, here's my little list. Uh, our land will be unposted, so it's open to public fishing. Um, let me just switch drawings here. Um, so that's a quick view of our shop design. Very exciting, intersecting eagle. Um, and then here is um, but just a depiction of what we have zoning permission for. So we have this, there's a big knoll in the middle of our property. This is Route 12. Um, and the back four or five acres of this land is all in the flood zone. So um, that will be left undeveloped because we are not allowed to develop back there. Um, so there are all sorts of things that we could do with this piece of land. Um, so again, left open for the public to fish along the river. Um, I'm not quite sure what that looks like in terms of posting the land, like welcoming people, but that's an intention. Um, there has been talk of a carry-in canoe launch. Um, that's something, again, that I really don't have a fully laid out plan for, but um, it would be a great spot, as Councillor Kruger pointed out, to connect to um, another launch at that park that's right next to Birch Grove. Mill Pond. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a couple of other things. Uh, we will definitely be raising one of, um, we have sort of a ready to buy off the shelf product called a picnic shelter. That's a picnic table with a little roof. Um, and we'll be building one of those um, that is accessible by bikers because there's a bike lane that runs right by where our shop will be. Um, we're interested in hosting community-based learning students from the high school and pot uh, potentially connecting with Barry's tech program to host interns. Um, we've talked about having an electric vehicle charging station. Um, we, and the last one is that we've heard talk of a path for bikers and walkers along the river that heads to the Mountaineers Field. I don't really know much about that, but we would love to participate in it <laughs> if anybody's going to make it happen. Um, so that's a list of public benefits and amenities. And the last thing I want to, um, sorry, two more things. Second to last thing I want to, um, say is that criteria for level three, um, there's actually a potential that we meet these criteria, so I will quickly describe that. Um, one of the criteria is that the project will result in a net increase in residential units within the city. Um, I cannot fully commit to this, but I can 90% commit to, um, our plan is to also build two houses on this piece of land. Don't mean to like throw a wrench into the <laughs> discussion, but there's that. And then the second criteria is that the project exceeds $500,000 or the assessed value, um, which is also a wrench because the assessed value of our, of our shop project that we have permission for um, 
is $490,000, but any house we would build would be much above $10,000. So, um, and then to close, I just want to um, speak to the but for clause. Does that is that term make sense to everybody? So um, we would certainly be building this shop whether we got tax stabilization or not. Um, so I can't. We don't qualify for that part, that criteria. Um, but I don't think anybody who is requesting tax stabilization could um, meet that criteria. It's, um, well, let me just give you my little spiel. So we've been a fiscally, fiscally conservative company that grew very slowly during our first decade. Um, we have never taken out a bank loan before this, and we were able to stay profitable with a small crew and bare bones infrastructure. Our work pipeline and our crew outgrew our facilities years ago, and building this shop is clearly the right move for us. Um, and we're, we're ready for this radical change, but it's a big financial leap. While we adjust to making large loan payments and figuring out how best to function in our new space, being able to add a couple thousand dollars to our bottom line would be a huge relief to our business, while still providing a big leap in what we're paying in municipal taxes. Um, it would just allow us the breathing room for these first couple of years until we can really refine our budgets to match this new business that we're growing into. So it would be a big, um, it would be a significant benefit for us, um, but in the context of a $650,000 construction project, a couple thousand dollars is not a make or break thing. So that's it, thank you. Okay, comments from the council? Ashley? <laughs> Um, so I've been consistent in my no votes on all of these. I, I just I think that there are better ways that the city can support businesses coming to our community. Um, and I think I mentioned some of these before. Like I would love for us as a city to commit to investing in creating public access points to the water, for example, and partnering with businesses. That's what I think that the city should be doing with taxpayer dollars. The city should be using those taxpayer dollars to make our city work for our taxpayers. Um, I love your plans for the facility. I think it's clearly a beautiful facility and you produce quality work. Um, but again, I just can't, I can't stand here, sit here uh, and, and vote to spend city tax dollars when we have residents who are looking for breathing room too. And I, I think that's a very apropos analogy because a lot of us are looking for breathing room. Um, and consistently the council votes to um, abate taxes for businesses but does nothing hardly ever to address unaffordability as an issue. We just got a huge handout about uh, Vermont being, you know, one of the most expensive places to live and you would in essence need 2.1 full-time jobs to support a two-bedroom apartment. Um, and I and I appreciate those struggles and I know that they're not limited to, you know, Montpelier residents um, and they're certainly, you're a human being too, right? And you face the same challenges that everyone else faces. And I am I am grateful that your business is coming to Montpelier, and I would love to support your business in other ways, partnering with you to address potentially, you know, an EV charging station. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think, you know, how we can foster partnerships with schools, both here and in Barrie, because I think we need to strengthen that relationship too. Um, I'm just, I'm a hard no on uh, abating tax dollars for a, a private business project with no public benefit. I would just make the case that there may be some public benefit there, but, that's, <laughs> but, but may is not well, is. Anyway, that's uh, uh, Donna. Well, we have this tax stabilization policy, and I feel you meet it. And not only that, but we spend a lot of time and energy to get new business in, and here we have an existing business that wants to expand and get even more committed. So I support giving you the tax abatement. To me, this is a much more reasonable amount than most. And uh, I would like to see the council move forward on it. And I would make a motion saying such. Is there a second? Which level are you going for? I think the recommendation level. Recommendation 1587. The amount of money, I guess I was looking for. <laughs> I think it's just a level. It, that's a, I think the dollar amount so is estimate. I think the question was whether they meet criteria two with, this, with the amount of jobs. That was the question the staff posed to the council. It's really your call. Anne, can I make a comment on that? And the public go ahead, go ahead. Um, So I think level two is the squishy one. Um, I think that they've made a good argument that they meet the requirements for level one. Um, and so level two requires us to decide whether 
seven more people is a substantial amount of um, uh, new employee or significant um, number of new employees. And then the other option under level two um, that they've sort of tried to meet and our ordinance isn't great here um, it is the public benefit. Um, and I, um, I don't think they meet the letter under the public benefit, but because they clearly are trying to offer some public benefits, I'm willing to be more uh, lenient on the, the squishy uh, significant number of jobs um, for, for the other option for level two. So I would be willing to offer level two, um, but I don't know if others are. So Donna, is that your motion? Wait, she can take the motion. <laughs> I was going by amount instead of criteria. I got my mind turned around, so. Would you like to make a motion? I guess I'm curious to see what other, well, sure, I'll make the motion and then we can. I'll second. <laughs> for level two. Yes. Well, can you make the motion, please? Sure. Um, I move to offer Timber Homes, Vermont. Uh, oh, we have to find that they meet the requirements of the. We'll draft that. Tax stabilization Tax policy at level two. At level two. And then there's a, sub, then there's a series of choices in level two, how much award. Range oh, I'm sorry. I haven't. To four years up to one third for seven years, or one half for four years. Or I've been wondering how that gets decided. <laughs> <laughs> we just Apparently you're looking at it. Depends how strong. How how. Five years. <laughs> five years. Okay, I'm hearing a suggestion for five years. <laughs> I will go with that. Level two for five years. Yep. One third or one half. The only option under five yeah, years is one third. You do either one third for five years or a half for four years, right? That's right. Which would be most helpful to your company? Um, I think I think half for four years would be more helpful. It's really these early years where we're okay. Like, um, so I would move for level two for uh, <laughs> uh, half for four years. Okay, I'll second that. I hope that we ask that question when we uh, talk about raising taxes for our residents. Sorry, and I apologize. I know that that was a little underhanded, but I just. Well, so um, I'm going to jump in and say I, I want to find ways that we can um, yeah, help our residents, and particularly those who need it the most. And I, I hope that we, I hope that we, you know, do some thinking around that as well. So. I just, to throw it out here, I did yeah. the math at $18 an hour, um, and at 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, um, that would be $37,440 pre-tax, which is still not enough for a Vermont housing wage to afford a market rate apartment in Montpelier. Uh, Jack. I, I really like everything about this uh, proposal. I like the company. I think you're gonna be a great asset to the city. I do not think the but for test is met, so I'm going to be more than uh, Yes, Clem. Um, I hear Ashley's and Jack's uh, points, I think. Um, I want to uh, suggest that there may be some interesting quirks of this whole setup that we should examine. Uh, I would be uh, pretty unhappy personally uh, if we chose Timber Homes Vermont as the first uh, business that requests this tax stabilization that we deny. Um, and uh, on the I don't know how much of this is really necessary to say, but as far as uh, level two uh, requirements, a significant level, a significant number of jobs in Montpelier, um, I'm not sure what number of jobs would not be significant. That, <laughs> that, uh, that criteria doesn't make perfect sense to me as written. Uh, one job is significant to me, and if we want to require a certain number of jobs for this to, to pass, then I think we should say we need, you know, a specific number. Uh, otherwise, we're, as far as I can see, we are saying if you are uh, a large corporation and you're going to add large numbers of jobs, then we will give you tax stabilization. If you're not a large corporation, then we will not. 
Um, so I say that if any job, number of jobs is significant, then seven is. Uh, and um, the other uh, question I want to ask uh, is, I believe the last group that came before us to ask for tax stabilization asked for a certain level for now and requested the ability to come back and upgrade their request. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Mm -hmm. They def asked to defer the benefits for a year to, to, because at that point they didn't have a tenant, so they want to be able to come back and say, now we meet the jobs criteria. Okay. But they also weren't going to take the benefit for a year. I see. Okay. Thank you. Connor. Um, I voted no on the last one. I think I agree with Ashley's analysis on the $18 an hour. It's, uh, you know, people have different definitions of what a livable wage is, and it would be different in Montpelier. Um, that said, I, I uh, do like the concept of an employee-owned business, and I do feel like that is the type of business uh, we should be looking to recruit, and I, I think I have some confidence in you that you would take that $18 an hour and maybe look at raising that as your business becomes successful in town. So. I plan to support it. Can I add a um, clarifying piece of information about that? Because it suddenly feels very important. Um, our seasonal workers this year are making $18 an hour. Our lowest paid long-term employee is making uh, $20.50 an hour and has dental insurance and um, paid time off and a training stipend. And um, uh, if we could do more, we would. Our highest paid person is making $27 an hour, and it's because uh, he's very generous. He should be making a lot more. Um, and I think I sympathize with Ashley's position. Um, and at the same time, I see that uh, even with tax stabilization, our tax bill is going to, I think, um, quadruple. Um, I'm hesitant to say that for sure because I can't crunch the numbers in my head right now. But it, even under tax stabilization, we'll be paying um, a great deal more in taxes to the city, and then after those four years, um, we plan to be here for a very long time, and so I see that tax bill as a benefit to the city in perpetuity, as long as we exist as a company. Um, and again, the but for clause, we just, I just can't imagine anybody meeting it. But I would say that um, we knew about the possibility of tax stabilization well before we came up with any of these designs or applied for zoning permission. Um, so we were hoping for it, and it sort of factored into our sense that people um, in the city felt very welcoming to our business. So um, in that way, uh, I don't know if that helps you think about that much, but. You've been more on it, or you've been a little too honest, perhaps, with the butt for <laughs> <laughs> Well, can anybody, I mean, can anybody really truly meet that? I mean, a construction project that's this, large, even if it's much smaller than this, any new construction is very expensive. And um, tax stabilization offers maybe a 1000 or $2,000 off your tax bill. So without actually answering your question, I'm just going to say that I think uh, so it's on our list to revise um, the <laughs> tax stabilization <laughs> ordinance. Great. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, OK. So uh, technically, this is a public hearing. So if there's any comments from the public on this, yeah. Not just technically. Action. So I'm going to speak in my capacity as a business coach, and my company is called Downtown Up. We specialize only in working with businesses that are very Vermont kinds of businesses like this, and we love them. Um, so in theory, I love this, and your business sounds fantastic. This is a more general question, and it's from reading the most recent article about this in the Argus. I was surprised in there that there was nothing mentioned about profits. And I, I'm wondering if... When a business comes and asks for this, if their books get open to you all, and if there's somebody who acts as a fiduciary in that capacity who looks at profits, and in a situation like this where there's going to be uh, a great, you know, a new strain on the company that's a major strain that's been identified as such, looking at how their books have been and how they're going to manage that strain, 
and also then asking the fiduciary question uh, along the lines of what Ashley is doing, but with other criteria in there, because Ashley's is one criteria of, well, what else could we be putting this money towards, and what's going to give the city the best return on its investment, uh, in you know, and the best chance of getting that return. So these are more questions that I that I raise. I think that that this kind of approach to any business is essential. It's good practice. Uh, as a business coach, I look at the books and I'm concerned with these things. And there are lots of businesses, I will say, the majority of businesses that I see uh, look great on the outside. And business is a very sexy thing. It looks great on the outside and we get excited about business. It's just important to know that when you you know, might not be news to you, but when you open the books and you start looking around, then things don't always look like they do on the outside. Uh, so that's uh, that's all. I don't have an opinion about this because I haven't looked at those books or gotten to know the business, but I want to put that out there as a general principle in this. You know, you were talking about revising these. So to the extent that these issues are not in there, then please put them in there because that's a great way to make decisions about businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah. I just, I would like to apologize to Councilmember Kruger and to the rest of you. I, I, it was. It's okay. <laughs> no. No, you're well, not. it's not okay, Fair. but it happened, and I hope that you all accept my apology, and I try to conduct myself in a more respectful way. It just. No offense was taken. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, you know, you, you raise a, a good point, and I, you know, it's, it's a, perspective that we need to keep in mind and um, you know what are we doing for um, you know the people who are the most vulnerable in our community and I, I want to keep that question in front of us so I appreciate it and we're adding the other half of the taxes to our tax roll that don't exist That's now right. <laughs> oh. yep okay um, all right so I'm going to close the public hearing um, and I, th I think we're probably ready to vote so um, all in favor please say aye aye, aye. Opposed? Nay. No. Okay. Uh, so the motion passes. Thank you very much. Best of luck. Thank you. And I think we're going to take a five-minute break. <laughs> okay, so we're going to bring our meeting back into order here. Um, and we're going to jump into talking about the first, uh, gosh, I lost it, first time we'll back over here. All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Um, so the first time home buyer program uh, was is an ongoing program. It's in its oh, fifth year now, um, and is administered by Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Uh, this proposal was uh, reviewed by the Housing Trust Fund Committee on May. 20, end of May. Um, and uh, the proposal from Down Street is for uh, the $60,000 in this year's allocation of the Montpelier Housing Trust Fund to provide um, first time home buyer grants, or loans rather, to uh, first, -time, first time buyers. The, the, the award this time was reduced from um, $10,000 to 7500 in this proposal as a way to try to capture more people. Um, the demand is high. Uh, the, the, actually, the inventory of houses is low um, for folks of what they can afford. Um, but there's a backlog. And so we wanted to kind of find a proposal where we could increase the total number of awards. Um, and when we, the, the folks from Downstreet came in and they felt like this, this would provide the assistance that was necessary um, and help young families get into town. Okay, comments. Um, I'm going to go Rosie, then Ashley, and go from there. Um, so I will keep it brief since everyone knows my position on the um, first time home buyer loan program. Um, I think it's something that sounds wonderful um, and in actuality is not as effective as other things that we could do with this money um, or hasn't been shown to be as effective as you know, we have not explored the other options. Um, and so uh, with some I've been uh, discussing with the housing task force. I've gone to some meetings this spring. Um, 
And out of that discussion came uh, the idea that uh, the task force should survey the folks who've received the loan um, in the past to see if this was the best use for them. Did it make an impact? Did it actually uh, mean the difference between buying a house in Montpelier and buying a house somewhere else? Um, and was that the most useful way to receive that kind of assistance? Would they have rather received uh, a $10,000 loan afterwards for energy efficiency or $10,000 uh, to do lead abatement or whatever else? Um, you know, was there something else that would have been more helpful than this, um, this form of assistance? Um, and that survey, I understand, is still out. Um, yes. And so at some point, we will have a better data point about is this the best way to spend $60,000? Um, to my view, uh, we have a huge, as Kevin said, a huge housing shortage. And to me, uh, the best way to address that shortage is to put the $60,000 towards increasing uh, the number of units um, through these big projects that we've been able to do periodically. Um, and once we spend this money, we'll have you know, gone back down to zero. So we'll have to start building that up again. Um, so I would prefer to, to see this um, spent a different way. Um, I voted. Uh, to, to do that um, during the, the housing task force uh, meeting. I do serve on that, um, and I, I lost there. So um, won't rehash that too much, but just wanted to put that out there. Just to, if I can respond to that quickly, too, is just one, one key piece, which I think is important, and the housing task force has, has asked for um, an, an increased funding for this very reason. One of the sections, section 106 of the housing trust fund gu guidelines, does give priority to home ownership programs over large scale, scale rentals. You know, when we look at this housing trust fund, it is there are, there are two pieces. There's projects and programs. This is a program. Um, you know, projects, which we do support. We gave $175,000 to the French block. Uh, you know, we, we give, it, give it to River Station and to uh, the North Branch Apartment. So it's, there's no question that there's a need for program for, for project funds. Um, and I suspect that the Housing tra Task Force will be back here to address that very issue. Um, I support this. I think this, is, I think this is one of the many things that we need to do here in Montpelier. The only um, sort of question slash general pondering mm -hmm. is, um, I was looking at the makeup of the Housing uh, Trust Fund Committee, um, and also um, I, I attended a coalition meeting, although a while ago now. Um, and I'm curious if there's ever been any conversation about having someone who has received this, like, serve on this committee to sort of talk about some of the challenges that they experienced in looking to sure. buy here and, and to sort of, like, have that perspective as someone who has received this and who has sort of you know, sort of added those things that we have desired to seek here in Montpelier? I mean, I think it would be great. It, it, um, generally speaking, with these appointments, it's whoever uh, is. I feel pretty strongly that we should reach out and see if sure. anyone is interested and willing to do that, because I think it's a really valuable perspective. And even just inviting people in to sort of talk about their experiences or just, I. I just I think that's really valuable, and if we are if we as a council are going to prioritize this, which I personally, you know, think that we should, I would love to hear from people who have experienced this and who have, you know, done what this program is intended to do. Yes, and then actually, just speaking to that too, is that we've got the survey out to about half of the folks that they received it. I'm still trying to get the contact information for the other half. Downstreet administers administers this program, so I don't have everyone's contact information, but I suspect that by the end of the summer we'll have. I'm we're not talking about that many people, so I, I can probably call them personally and fill out the survey if, if necessary. Um, and I do want to get all that information in. So. Uh, do you have a set number of seats on the committee? There is a set number of seats. Uh, so it's, it's currently six. What um, if we created an ex officio position on that committee specifically intended to be filled by someone who... A recipient a of recipient. this trust fund? Yeah. Do we, how do we feel about that? I was kind of curious how you ended up with six. Usually they're an odd six. number. It is, six is an odd number, and part of it was that we had. Six um, is even. 
Well, we have two council members now, and that was a function of uh, we lost some members, and uh, Council Member Walsh was on it, and then Gene Olson, and it, there was a shift. Question is, would it make sense to have a seventh member? It would actually be helpful in the event of a tie because I, I could see it happening for sure. Yeah, a seventh member and, and you know with a it is someone who's who's a recipient the housing program. Yeah, like this one. I yeah, but I was trying. Yes. Well, so one possibility is we could do that now. Another possibility is that maybe we do a little work around that. I'd like to do a little work. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I can put together a proposal okay. for membership. Let the task force recommend us what they think. Put yes. it on the or the task force. Yeah. It should be more than one. It should be more than one. More one than of one. any single type is not good. They should have more than one. Just as an aside, too, one of the other uh, requests was that um, out of that housing trust fund meeting, um, policy issues came up. And the Housing Trust Fund Committee evaluates the proposals, but it doesn't necessarily evaluate policy, which is the task force's role. The Trust Fund Committee made a recommendation to ask council, uh, or is requesting from council, to have, have the tr task force evaluate the Housing Trust Fund guidelines to become um, more in line with our current situation. I don't want to needlessly extend discussion. I support this. I think that uh, I've heard the uh, comments that Rosie makes, and I think there are some good points that there are the, the need for housing in the city of Montpelier and the need for public assistance for housing in the city of Montpelier is not. Uh, satisfied by devoting $60,000 to it. And I would, when I was the chair of the task force, I was coming in here saying, we need to put more money into the trust fund because uh, the needs aren't being met. And that's, that's what I think now. But uh, in this case, Downstreet heard the uh, comments from the council uh, when they came in here before in previous years and said people had concerns about various aspects of it and they uh, they came back and uh, modified the, uh, the program to uh, to meet some of the concerns the council had and uh, I think it's a good thing to recognize and reward that and I'm certainly going to support this. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go, Donna, since you haven't waited yet. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion and just let people okay. then talk about it if they want to or not. Time. I would like to make a motion to approve the Housing Trust Fund recommendation to approve the request of $60,000 for first time home buyers down payment assistant and equity building program beginning July 1, 2018. Second. What other of you like to weigh in? Okay. So I just, Jack is absolutely correct that um, they did make some changes to the program based on our feedback, and I was remiss in not thanking them for doing that. Um, I do really appreciate that uh, that it is now a repayment upon sale um, that takes into account the likelihood that you would have uh, gained equity over that time, um, and I think that makes it a much more sustainable program, and I appreciate that. Um, my, my default would be to support this, but I'm also very interested in that data point um, because if the feedback tells us otherwise, that's going to be really important. And I'm very thankful that we, we put together that survey and I, I, do, um, you think it'll be done by the end of the summer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, is that something that we can put on the calendar for September? Well, yep. Um, so the. We actually, the Housing Task Force met on last Thursday, and there was a discussion about coming to council um, with some of these issues um, and doing a presentation uh, for some of the new members on what the task force does um, and what our, our goals are. In September 12th, I think, was the first council meeting we were hoping to get on okay. um, and do that. And you could build that into that? Yeah, we'll build that okay. into it. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, any um, no motion? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 
Opposed? No. Okay, thank you. Great, well, thank you. And uh, moving right along. Okay. Social and Economic Equality Committee. I'm going to okay. look at Ashley oh, on this one. Appreciate it. So, this is something that has been on my mind for quite some while. Um, and the mayor and I met to sort of discuss and brainstorm. Um, so I apologize that I'm looking at my phone, but that's where I have access to the document. Um, so, I and I know that Bill had reached out to me earlier and I dropped the ball on replying to him. Uh, so I apologize that nobody has this also. Um, but basically what, um, what I envisioned and, and working with Anne to sort of finesse those things, sometimes I'm a little bombastic, I know, um, is forming a group here in Montpelier to really sort of uh, talk about how we can promote diverse socioeconomic, racial, cultural, and gender inclusivity and awareness among the city's residents, businesses, uh, and also in our municipal affairs. The group um, we envisioned will help make Montpelier a city that cultivates and embraces diversity. The committee will also assist the city in addressing the goals laid out in the master plan and council's yearly goals as they pertain to social equity and justice. Um, that's more or less the mission of the group. Right, okay. yes. Um, and uh, we're hoping to be able to accomplish that mission uh, through educational activities for the public, specific programming and projects, uh, and advising and making recommendations to the council uh, and or other relevant bodies um, and working with the city manager as well. Um, we had proposed a maximum of six members, uh, although I hear that there may be some wisdom in odd numbers. Um, so I would actually probably go for seven, not five, just because I think the more people we have at the table, um, the better for talking about these really significant issues in our community. Um, I'm thinking one to two council seats, um, and then having folks who are interested fill out the application, and then having um, those committee uh, applications be reviewed. Um, and then if we have any sort of specific questions, um, potentially putting those together and then submitting, the, you know, sending those out to everyone who um, who put in to, to be part of the committee. Um, Hopefully we could meet once a month. I, it's summertime, so that's a little tricky, but I figure maybe we could start in August would be my sincerest hope, maybe towards the end of August. Uh, and some of the proposed projects and tasks that I would like uh, us to start looking at um, is the feasibility of a potential living wage policy for the city and uh, its contractors, uh, developing a um, babysitting availability policy for city meetings, um, Reviewing uh, a socially responsible investing policy. I know that was one thing that had been flagged by us uh, several months ago, and it's something that I don't want to lose sight of because I think it is important. Uh, review or revise the tax stabilization policy. I need not say <laughs> any more about my position on how important that is. Um, plan uh, a civil discord and implicit bias training uh, on both um, on sort of the impact uh, and ways that we can adapt our policies to be mindful uh, of the impact that that can have. Uh, and review city policies to ensure equity, including in hiring practices, and um, work with the city to review personnel policies regarding paid family leave. Can we add to that? Um, oh, we can add anything. <laughs> uh, um, um, uh, just working with uh, new directions in terms of yes, at absolutely. Um, and I think a sort of a broader piece of that, and I've, I've spoken with Chief about this, Chief Fakos as well, um, really sort of focusing on ways that we can start addressing addiction generally in our community. I've heard a lot of feedback from um, friends and uh, friends who have become a family of mine in this area who uh, don't feel very supported by the Montpelier community uh, in terms of being in recovery. And I would really like us as the, the sort of leaders in our community to, um, to start tackling those really significant issues that, uh, and I, as you all know, I, I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in my work, but uh, a friend of mine died of an overdose here in Montpelier, uh, recently a heroin uh, and other drug-related overdose, and um, it's something that is very real, and we heard tonight that, uh, you know, there are, are 
community services are, are utilizing Narcan at least once a week. Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do as community leaders uh, in that front as well. I was hoping one of the overarching goals of this group would be to bring in experts who already exist in our community yeah. and that they would have a, a place holding like different organizations and including the high school the Justice Alliance so that it wasn't just people applying but that we reached out to specific organizations for specific skills and, and experience. And I, I, I think that makes sense to reach out and see, but also opening it up to everyone else as well. And, and rather than having like a, I'm never quite sure if it's prescribed or proscribed. I'm gonna demonstrate my ignorance there, but um, I, want, I want this to be inclusive. And if we get <laughs> more than five or seven people are at, the, at the table, I'm more than willing to, to sort of revisit that. And, and this is community work, this is gonna take shareholders from organizations and from you know our schools and from all sorts of different places so um, certainly we can reach out to organizations that that do this work already but I, I also want to open it up to everyone else and hopefully hopefully we're in a position where we have far more interested persons that want to do the work than than we do uh, folks that don't so uh, I'm using the Energy Committee as the model for this. Uh, it feels like there's some um, appropriate parallels. Uh, and so the Energy Committee, uh, at least at one point, created some ex officio positions for uh, stakeholder organizations uh, that we wanted intentionally to invite to the table. Um, but we already had members, and so you know, how are we going to get them there in any kind of official capacity? So it seems like that might be an option you know, if you want to have an open invitation to the Racial Justice Alliance or, uh, you know, Justice for All or, you know, whoever, um, to be a part of it, we can right. do that. Yeah. And your stakeholders may vary on the specific topic sure, you're dealing sure. with, but especially when you get into really uh, oh, public awareness and workshops, you really need those stakeholders. Absolutely. Okay, other thoughts? Um, yeah. I think this is great, and I really appreciate Ashley doing the brain work on this. Okay. Um, so I guess we probably need a motion to create this. Create well, the committee, whatever makeup you want, and obviously direct us to advertise for it. So I will selfishly make the motion if that's OK. <laughs> um, I would move that we create a social justice advisory committee uh, for the city of Montpelier. Um, and I'm not clear about the how specific it needs to be. Just form the committee and then. Well, I would say with seven members. Okay. Um, to be. F and you said one to two council members. I mean, yes. that's a decision you should make yes. right off. Yeah. All right. So I would move then that we create the social justice advisory committee uh, with seven members, uh, no more than two of which uh, maybe council members. I'll second. That's everything that we need for now. Okay, great. Any further discussion? Would we then do a motion appointing two council members or wait till we had the applications? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I guess I would, in that we're creating it tonight, I would want to wait on putting people on it. Let it sort of, let it breathe. Good. <laughs> and then, um, and then I guess we'll ask Jamie to put out an advertisement um, for this and then later time. Does that sound okay? Yeah. That's good. All right. So, um, yes, Jack. One thought I have, I heard what uh, Ashley said about the, uh, and you said about numbers. I wonder if uh, it might be encouraging to have like nine instead of seven, like maybe seven plus two council members. Um, I'm not making it for me as a motion to amend because I get just want to throw it out as an idea. Let's see if we can get see seven people yeah. to the table and if it becomes clear that we have a lot of folks who are very interested and would seemingly be a good fit. Again, with the parallel of the Energy Committee, one of the challenges has been um, because it's not a, a, a committee that is Prescribed or proscribed? I'm never. I'm not prescribed. Prescribed, prescribed. Thank you. is for good. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's prescribed by the state or our charter. Um, we can just add seats anytime. So we might as well start with seven, and then if there are more people and, and there's 
in the, it, you know, a year down the road, if we're like, ah, oh, we got some really great candidates, you know, we can always change it. So it's fun. Okay. Um, for the discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Very exciting. Um, so I assume we'll put a deadline of that of like two weeks, three weeks. I don't know. Whatever's normal for advertising for that position. Okay, great. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, okay, so the proposed ordinance revisions. You lickety slip, slip, slickety split. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Is it right. getting late? Oh, my Lord. I've been here in this building since 6 30, oh I will gosh. have you all know. Okay, uh, this is just fixing things to work. Sorry? Should we start by opening the public hearing? Oh. Oh, there, is this a public hearing one? Yes, so yeah. first reading of an ordinance. Okay, well, we're going to open the public hearing. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I had just mentioned these before. This is some things that I thought were done by the council a gazillion years ago, and they weren't done. They were left hanging. It was my fault. Uh, the changes would just, in this, before any other bigger changes you want to make, this would just knock off a couple goofy licenses there at the end that were put on when I was more young and foolish um, that should never have been on there and don't make sense. Um, and then just all the rest of them, it takes away the, uh, um, the, the, the costs, the license fees, and instead creates a, a provision whereby you all review the license fees every year and can make what changes whatever you want. And that's it. What are the licenses that you're getting rid of? The license is getting rid of is one that was just badly considered, which was a, a license for um, uh, medical marijuana dispensaries. Just, you know, just conversation I had with folks, and it'd be like, well, we might want to keep an eye on that in case, you know, we wanted to be involved. It's a terrible idea. And then the other one was a $20 uh, fee for um, catering, for catering requests that would come in. Or actually, it was a one time $20 catering license fee to be a caterer in the town. Days after that was that was passed, the state introduced one, and it just seemed cruel. <laughs> and I thought we'd gotten rid of them. So. Okay, I'm gonna jump in here. Well, actually, I have a question um, for you, John. So, were you you're saying that these are uh, fees that we should just not? It, it's uh, it's not that we're taking them out of the ordinance, putting them in like a different schedule. It's that we're just taking them out because we shouldn't be doing them. The intent is not to move them. It's that they, we're just doing away with them. Well, and this was originally Tom Galanka's idea. He just wanted the council to have say over them without having to do the whole ordinance rigmarole. I, I think the confusion. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. I think the confusion is you're doing two things here. You're striking two licenses, and you're also taking the other ones, the the amounts, out of the ordinance so that we can review them every year. Yeah. So there's two omnibus. that we won't have anymore, and then the rest we'll just review every year. So exactly. two pieces. I, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be the one that makes this longer. Awesome. <laughs> uh, because uh, I there are certain fees in here that I want to keep and whether we keep them in the ordinance or you know it cites this a schedule and we you know we have them in the schedule that's fine I don't really care which place it is but I it makes me uncomfortable to just repeal it from here and not have it in schedule elsewhere oh I think by default they would I mean because it doesn't say there's going to be no fees. Mm -hmm. It just says that it's a, the fees the council sets. So I presume that the under under that scenario, this, the fees as they stand would continue until, or if not, we, we could certainly concurrently pass the schedule as it is. I would rather do that. That's my preference. I would we rather do that in second reading. Mm -hmm. I would rather do that. Um, did you have another comment, Ash? No, that was my suggestion that next meeting we also adopt a schedule of, of Get fees. Get the list together. Well, okay. I already have the list together. So, okay. <laughs> so that 
conceivably there we might not be doing actually doing away with any. It's just a right. Well, except for those last two that we're doing the, away with. The, the catering thing and the medical marijuana dispensary. Those are my, my recommendations where to get rid of those, but you all can keep them if you want. Obviously. Strong feelings about it. Um, other comments? We need to do it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I guess we're going to close the public hearing then, and uh, we'll hear from you again. Probably at the July meeting, which I will not be at. I'll make sure that list is okay. important. Okay. Right. Do we need to, does it need to go to? Should we oh. close first reading and set second reading for July 25th? 25th. Right. That's what we're doing. Honestly, yeah, we don't want to get rid of the fees either. We'll protect you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really looking at you know, like the gas stations. Yep, yep. yep. Um, uh, Okay, so we've closed the first. Do we need a motion to or vote? We to always do have. No. Well, oh. you could do it unanimous Okay, by unanimous consent, without objection, closing the first public hearing and setting the date for the next one at the July 25th. Great. Okay, and on to the strategic plan. Okay, just vote to approve it. Um, we did send out, send this out to you electronically, and then I believe there's, I, I got a hard copy. Did anybody else know? Nope. No. Nope. Oh, I thought Jamie was handing nope. them out. Oh, well, sorry. Um, got some comments, which we've incorporated from a couple of you, and attempted to take the policies and priorities that you had set in our workshop and lay them out into, a, into functional work. Uh, we still need to add the dates and deadlines but we want to make sure it's the work that you want done. This will then drive our next, our agendas for the next few months. They know, we, those will now start showing up and I probably will be the person when new ideas come up that says that really wasn't on the, the, the plan. You know, do you want to, how do we want to fit that in? Um, but that's why we did the work up front. So. Uh, Bill, can I ask if there was anything, any work that the city is doing right now that you had kind of taken as like, of course we do this, that you don't feel is represented in here? And um, No, I mean, generally, I mean, we didn't really list all the services we mm -hmm. delivered. Well, we had that maintain city services, but I, I don't know. I was just, no, I didn't feel like we were missing anything, but I also no, wanted but, the advice of the manager. But we also pushed we were, the staff. They were heavily involved in yeah, this, too, staff. this year. And so I think That's they true. also really appreciated. And so they tried to put forth their key issues. And I think the hardest thing for us, actually, was you know we'd get sort of long lists of activities. And for us, it was really sorting through uh, what are the real action items and what are things to consider when doing the action items you know some of these are just ideas like actually you know just one we talked about for example was about the living wage re requirement you know the, rep the the action is really bringing you a report on it but to, to do the report we've got to figure out what does it mean what's this law you know but we had our first draft like all of those is different steps we're like no we're not going to track all those steps the step is but this notes what needs to be in there so any suggestions this will also end up in our Invisio software and as a public dashboard so people can see progress on at least the big topics. So. Donna. Well, I really loved it having everything in one place got lost in items. No way could I edit it. Uh, I'd love to have the final product in a little booklet. Mm -hmm. it sure. Really. And, I, and the way you put things into charts really worked for me. Great. So I appreciated the work. Well, it was really set up by a um, combination of uh, Julia Novak's firm and Invisio, they, they worked together to set it up, and then Jamie did all the work on, you know, the oh, thank her. setting it up and helping draft it. And Sue was really so. Um, I don't know if uh, people want to sit through this. I made some notes. I thought this was great having the work plan, and I. We actually have paper big enough at my office to 
<laughs> print it in, in a way that it can be uh, read. Which is, Please, which just is give nice. your comments to Bill. <laughs> are they, are they like, grammatical? Well, no, they're not. Some are, really, are kind of substantive. Um, so I'll just hit them and see how people yep. feel about them. Is it the, just on that page? Because I can draw it up here. Um, it's on all the work plan pages. Okay. Okay. And the way it printed out, I'm sorry, it's not necessarily in the order that, that you have. On the plastic bag ban, I would put other single-use plastic items into that uh, study. On the question, this is a technical question on using uh, local ash trees that are being removed for uh, energy. I would like to make someone figure make the determination that it's safe to do that and not won't have uh, the effect of spreading at ash borer faster if, uh, if we do that. Um, in the community prosperity item, the problem being solved is listed as lack of jobs, vacant storefronts, and the shrinking grand list. And that's not really. I had a question. Is, is the grand list shrinking? I didn't think so. No. And uh, with probably static, maybe. maybe. And with regard to the storefronts, vacant storefronts, I don't necessarily think of that as the concern is being limited to retail space. I think there are pro there's probably other unused space that uh, is worth looking at, you know, office and uh, residential space in the downtown area. So underutilized space? Yeah. Um, in the uh, in the strategic income outcome housing area, we have a measurement of success: 150 new housing units for all ranges. I would. I don't know if there should be a specific number, but I think that we should be looking at targeting housing for low and moderate income people. I just took that number straight out of the, the economic development strategic plan. It was the only place where we actually referenced a number. It doesn't, uh -huh. I, it, I have, there's no, nothing to that other than that. So if you guys want to change that, that's fine. There was no. Um, should we, if we don't agree with something, should we say something? Yep. Um, can we just get through your list? Yeah, I like think. Like, just punch it and then we'll I, comment. I think I only have one other thing, which is in the uh, topic of encouraging more resident engagement with government. I've had this idea for a few years, several years, because my daughter in law participated in something like that, that when she lived in New Haven. And I just have like a community service job fair, have some kind of gathering where we actively recruit people who live in the city to come out and volunteer to be on boards, city boards and, and nonprofit boards and get all these entities that need community volunteers together in one place and really make a push. So we're not always in the position of the city publishes a opening, there's one applicant for it. And I think, you know, there, people put in a tremendous amount of volunteer effort, but I think there's probably other people who aren't the usual suspects who, if they were asked, would also come out and work with us. And I think that's my list. Okay, comments on those? Items. So, uh, in terms of the um, the first one, I think which is listed right now is banned plastic bags. That is my number one priority right now. I'd I'd be comfortable adding like an explore banning other single use plastics, but as a sort of primary, I think we were all clear that it was plastic bags. I actually am so because of the process that I, we're likely to go through in terms of um, uh, getting a charter change, I think we're actually more likely to get the charter change passed if we limit our conversation to plastic bags. And then once we have the charter change, you know, we can maybe have that conversation. 
because I don't think the charter change is going to be just specifically about plastic bags. Does that make any sense? Maybe I'm too. I'm not sure how it so I think, can I read? Yeah. So I think maybe what Anna's saying, or at least my sort of take on that is, because I've thought about that too, is the charter change would allow us to regulate those things, right? Or to abolish or something. Maybe it would say, you know, maybe the charter change would say something like single-use plastic, or, you know, what, however we structure the language. And, and we'd have the work done on the plastic bag piece and then could start the work on the rest because of what the charter change said. So rather than sort of trying to do all of those different things at once, focus our efforts on one thing, yeah. the charter change will allow for, uh, in theory, would allow for all of those things to be examined and for the city to potentially regulate. Yeah. And then we can- So maybe under notes, we could put consider other single use. That's fair. That's fine. Um, and in terms of the number of units comment, I, I had a meeting, um, with uh, Harry, who came and presented to us. Um, and, and it sounds like there's actually a pretty compelling argument to create market rate units as well. Um, and so I just, I want to be mindful of that. And I don't want in any way, like, I, I just don't want to, to signal to anyone that we're not exploring market rate housing. So I agree that we need to focus a lot of effort on low and moderate income housing. But I also think that there is a demand um, for market rate housing, and I, I just don't want to write that out of our housing plan. And that was actually, if you look at the initiative above right. that you came up with, it said develop a strategy to address housing shortage and ensure housing for all incomes and stages of life. Oh, yep. So that was the goal we were trying to hit. Was okay. Comments on Jack's. Uh, I'm going to assume that uh, silence is uh, a, a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so I had a couple things that I wanted to comment on. Um, as it references the net zero energy goals, it doesn't actually say what the net zero energy goal is, um, which is uh, to be, well, to be producing as much as we consume renewably within the city of Montpelier in all of the three major transportation sectors, or three major energy sectors, um, by 2030. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that at least somewhere we say that. <coughs> um, so that's one thing. Um, there was a section about communication. Um, I would just love to suggest as an action item that we explore uh, the pros and cons of uh, the uh, app known as C-Click Fix, which is something that Burlington has where you can geotag uh, potholes or graffiti or whatever. Um, and, you know, it's expensive and it would probably require staff time to like, be monitoring it. Um, so I'm not necessarily convinced that that's something that we need, but I just want to, I would love to have a conversation. Like, is, how far out of our range is that? Or is it, or is it something that's so valuable that, like, well, we should step up and do that? Yes, yeah, sorry. Bill, there is something that DPW has. The pedestrians were using it. The bicycles were going to start using it to report. Well, if they get a call, we have the, you know, if someone calls, they, they re record. They have a system where they enter the complaint and keep track no, of no, it. This but, was an electronic, um, and I can't remember the terms, but I'll, I'll talk to to, to Tom and Corey about it. Yeah. They were trying it out, and they were going to start with the pedestrians before they... Okay, well, I'll, ch I'll check with them. Maybe I... Yeah. But I think as the notes under the... But it wasn't as expensive, and it was More wasn't. resident engagement. Yep, yes, but that's the... Explore Seaclix fix. Yep. yep. Um, I think there was a section... I'm not looking at it. I have too many tabs open, but... Um, uh, there's a section on parking. There's something to do parking. Yeah. So um, I just want to put out there... Um, I would love <laughs> this might be a bigger ask than I'm making it sound right now, but um, I would love to put out on the action um, items something about reverse angle parking. So like either explore reverse angle parking or find an opportunity to try it or um, yeah, yeah. What, how, what, what's your thought about that bill? Um, I mean, if, if so, I don't have any problem with that. Okay. I think it's uh, 
Um, in fact, um, it just the, the two areas that you identified as top priorities were dealing with the loss of parking during the construction right. and basically dealing with the parking garage. Right. So we didn't talk right. about other explorations. So I don't know where that falls. I mean, we, yeah, we have talked about looking, you know, just without wandering off the path here too far, with the Union Elementary School playground construction, we've talked about, okay, well, you know, should we redo that road while, you know, for, we'll be hearing about possibly closing it for a period of time and so it can be used as a playground and when it's done, could we widen the sidewalk? You know, it, it, it used to be a two-way street. We've made it one way. It's still too wide for a one way so people don't always follow it. So could we narrow the street up and or could we put more angle parking because there's such a parking crunch there and that might be an interesting place to try single parking and so that could just be right let's well, try and that i would place. love that and i want to make sure that it's supported right. you know if it does take public education right. and a little bit of you know, <laughs> fte time yeah it did on. come up in the main street scoping and it is one of the suggestions to try on main street um so i'm trying to think if there's any better place that that fits yep. um under complete space. streets yeah, yeah that's, yep. that's true um it there that's find great a place to put it okay and uh, one other um, actually a couple other, <laughs> couple other things um, one is I mean we had something about um, expanding uh, recreational areas I just want to put forward the idea that um, the river itself may constitute a recreational area mm. and uh, I don't know how to say that exactly in here, but um, just want to recognize that uh, that may be an opportunity for expanding recreation or recreational opportunities. <clears throat> um, and also, just as a, as a part of that, um, I, I just want to also make a note that I think the, the River Conservancy um, has a, I mean, we had people from the River Conservancy here a few weeks ago talking about the facing the river um, approach to development and I would I would just love to engage them somehow in a way of like maybe doing a little thinking or a little visioning about what we could be doing um, so I just want to sort of seed that idea right now um, see where that goes <clears throat> um, okay so I have one well one we do have as an action item which we probably would engage someone like the River Conservancy, is yeah. develop a plan to improve existing riverfront access from Gateway, MHS, Bike Path, Rec Field, et cetera. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's, that's uh, already covered then. That sounds good to me. Um, you know, there is, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by this idea that came up during our um, conversation with uh, the Rec Department rec and the Senior Center. Um, in talking about thinking through the non-recreation needs of non-seniors. And so what do non-seniors need that is outside of the scope of the rec department? And I, did, I didn't know where to put that. I mean, may, I know we're doing this um, feasibility study about new rec building um, or updating the rec building. And so like, it's sort of inherent in that, like what are the needs of the community? But it sort of felt like maybe that could be an action step in terms of thinking through those um, those needs. Yeah, Jay. When you say non-recreation -re needs, are you talking about non-exercise? Right. Okay. Well, just whatever would be not falling under the rec department right now. So what might that be? It might be easier to think of. I, I'm having trouble imagining what you mean. So, I mean, in, just as some, some examples, I mean, I think of, like, the needs that say young adults in our community might need around like financial literacy or like the educational needs of like young mothers um, as they're like trying to figure out what that is or, or single parents even <clears throat> or I mean as something that we've talked to before like what are the community needs community needs or like affordable child care um, of families working families you know like there's a whole bunch of so things that I can imagine might be appropriate for a community services department 
that are not re recreation. What are the gaps not, in community right, services? And not specific to seniors. Um, and I don't know that we can depend on the feasibility study to do that for us. Well, that's about a building, right? Yeah. So. It's perfect for the social equity community. Sure. Right? But actually, though. <laughs> Um, I just want to put in one more plug for like, I would love to, maybe this is a social equity thing as well, but like thinking through um, how are we addressing energy issues for renters? Yes. And, you know, whether there's a split incentive or not a split incentive. You know, but if we can come up with a program with Green Mountain Power, great. If not, can we look at tax? And did that get? Did that get a it lot of did, dots? It did not get a lot of dots. <laughs> Bringing it up again. It get a lot of dots. I know. <laughs> anyway, maybe I'll just like really get that. Hopefully to the committee. Just saying. Still in my radar. I'm just, sorry. I just, that was fine. I just wanted to say it out oh, loud. You're sneaking it in the back. Still door. like just pushing on it. If you're gonna do that, then I want my tag sale. What's that? Oh, I'm so in favor of tag sale. I think it's great. Um, didn't get dots, uh, okay. I don't know. Thank you for enduring my comments. I'm, I'm done. Any, are there thoughts or comments, any objections? Silence is complicitness. No. So I think if that's the case, then with those changes, you should formally adopt it. So then we'll, we'll give you a cleanup version, but you should adopt it, because then that becomes the policy of the council and further. Any other people who want to make some just one final thought um, is that as we did all these tours, we all kind of made this discussion about like, wouldn't it be nice to have a Montpelier Day where everybody got to see all the services that the city provides? And I don't know that it's a high priority to do, but I would sort of, it seems like it's feasible in the next year to do something like that. So I would just like to mention that as something that we might support. I, I love the idea of like a Montpelier Day where we're featuring city departments where maybe this is also we can combine that with like the job fair or the community, the community service fair community services fair right where we're like here are the committees that exist and maybe we could do a tag sale maybe we day. can have a tag sale <laughs> <laughs> with your counselors What's that? and coffee with your counselors sure anyway i'm open to that idea yeah, we put, I don't know, I don't know how. On yeah, I don't know how much, but I, I also realize that this is our work plan for the next year, and I wouldn't want to lose that because it just seemed like a something we all really. So one hypothesis is that. Um, Councilmember Kruger would head that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we can plan it for you know, next spring. And we'll, we'll keep. Yeah, we can keep we talking keep about talking. it. Okay. Okay. We should schedule it among the construction as sort of a good feeling day. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my topic of the year. Yeah. After uh, dealing with closed down state road street construction. Okay. Oh, trucks and stuff. Um, they really love us. So I mean, there's no further uh, comments. So you want a motion to? That would be great. Do you want uh, approved or amended or, or adopted? I'd just say that you adopt it as okay. part of the changes discussed tonight. So I, uh, my motion would be that the council adopt the strategic outcome and priority activities as edited. <laughs> Second. Other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Hmm. That feels really good yeah, to get that done. Thank you all. Thank you for doing the process and going through this. Great. Yeah, I, this is a great list. It is. I'm excited about it. Um, okay, so I think that is the end of our regular business. Year, the note on here is, is not an executive session. It is. It is. Yes. It is an executive session. Never mind. Executive Sorry. Session. Thank you. <laughs> Finish reading the whole thing. Okay, uh, council reports. Uh, gosh, let's start with Donna. I would like to announce that the Complete Streets Committee is inviting all citizens of Montpelier and nearby friends and neighbors to rename the popular recreation path that travels along the Winooski River from Granite Street to Junction Dog River Road. And this is going to open July 1 and go through September 3rd. There are going to be forms online as well as distributed. There's going to be a box in City Hall to put your form in. And there is going to be a $100 gift certificate from Onion River Outdoors. So. Look for Name the Path contest sheet or go online and find it after July 1. 
Can we get a link to that on our main page, home page? We'd love to make that easy. Any, is there, there's no criteria or limits or off limits? Uh, it's all in the sheet. I don't have to okay. read it all. I mean, it's a wonderful so form that Jamie worked with uh, Gary Hollowell and the committee Super. to put together. And People buy naming yes. rights? And just the other thing, I have a granddaughter that I have to pick up from a babysitter, and I'm going to be hard-pressed to be here much after 1030. Okay. So then go okay. fast. Burn right through it. Uh, don't know if it's totally appropriate. I'd like to express disgust for the U.S. Supreme Court decision today, Janus versus AFSCME, uh, which effectively makes Vermont a right to work for less state. Um, and I think it's appropriate just to show some appreciation for our public employee unions here in the city. Uh, they make our city a better place. Um, Sorry to be a downer. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> uh, I'll be at Baguito's again tomorrow morning, 8.30 to 9.30, if anyone wants to show up and talk. Uh, I have continued to enjoy and learn from that uh, experience. I also want to mention that, because um, I know not everyone is a breakfast sort of person, uh, <laughs> and, and because a lot of this really is for me to figure this job out eventually, uh, I am trying to uh, find people to take a walk with at some other point. Uh, I've, I've walked with my friend John Snell uh, not too long ago, and also with uh, a couple of other folks uh, whose names are escaping me because it's too late. Um, but uh, I will be looking for, for people to have conversations with about how I can do this job better, how Montpelier can be a, a better place, and if you think you have ideas, Come find me. Careful, I'm in your district. <laughs> Including you, John. <laughs> Anytime. I liked our walk, Glenn. I would oh, never yes. forget yeah, it. You, you were the one of the people <laughs> I forgot. Sorry, Con. Yes, that was nice. Uh, yeah, let's just go around. Um, so I hope to see lots of folks out at our parade, parades at, for anyone who has ever joined me in the parade for city council on parade day. It's the most fun thing ever. Um, and I, I'm assuming that we will be in the same place that we were last year. I think I still have the banner from last year. Um, so I hope that there are other council members who are planning on joining us in the parade because truly, a Hill takes parades seriously. <laughs> um, so I hope to see lots of folks out on the streets that day. And there's lots of other activities going on that day, too. I think there's stuff going on at the State House, and there's plenty of things going on here in town. So hopefully everybody can get out and enjoy some of the great things that we're doing here in town. I made my, my family delay leaving for vacation yes. so I could be in the parade. Oh, uh, yes. It's, it's Great experience. And, it is. It's so fun. And I've, I've been in the parade so many times, but this is a new thing for me as a council member. I had two things. One is that uh, I'm he hearing some comments about uh, route, proposed route changes for Green Mountain Transit. And obviously, the Montpelier City Council doesn't get to tell Green Mountain Transit what to do, but I wonder if there's uh, some role to be and at least asking them to come and talk to us about it. Um, and then the other thing uh, is a comment directed to anyone who's still at home watching the meeting, which is that I've, uh, there's a phenomenon that I've noticed that if uh, very often someone comes to the city council meeting to talk about a specific item, and once they're here, they realize that there are, might be two or three other items on the agenda that they are interested in that they also step forth and address the council about. And that makes me say, folks, come out to your meetings and because uh, we want to hear from you. And they're even more interesting if you're here in person than if you're watching <laughs> them on, on TV. Um, I wanted to thank um, Jamie Granfield for um, putting up the um, 
the new committee application online and making some, she's made some revisions to that. Um, folks' information is going to be a little more private, um, their personal contact information, um, and I really appreciate her quick turnaround on that um, while we still get all the information that we need to make good decisions. Um, so I think this is great progress. Um, there was something else I wanted to thank Jamie for, and I don't remember, so I will send her an email. But <laughs> um, uh, I also wanted to say that um, since school is out, this is a really hard time of year for kids who rely on some, on school meals um, for for multiple meals a day. Um, so the, I noticed that um, Just Basics put out a call for food pantry donations because they do see um, increased uh, need at this time of year. Um, and then I also wanted to point folks to um, USDA's Summer Food Rocks website, which is a finder for a summer meal site nearest you. And I know folks in the city have been working really hard to make sure that the meal site here in Montpelier happens again this year. And it seems like that, it, hopefully, fingers crossed, it is going to happen. Um, but it's, um, I just want to bear in mind that this is a hard time of year for, for, um, for those families and uh, to make that resource available. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, so I want to say a quick congratulations to uh, the Stable Montpelier, or yeah, the Stable Montpelier Coalition, as well as uh, the Vermont River Conservancy. Um, they just got a gigantic grant, um, the Candidate Foundation. So they're going to be empowered to do a lot of work soon. I'm, I'm so grateful uh, for the Candidate Foundation uh, seeing fit to. Uh, invest in our community. Um, and just a reminder that I will not be here at the July meeting. Um, so I may weigh in early on some things uh, just that I know are going to be on that uh, agenda. Uh, so uh, there's that. And then just on a other you know, more general note, I just want to say, I mean, the news lately has been so difficult and so bad that, um, uh, I mean, we all, we all deal with it in different ways. Um, and so just a reminder, have grace for each other as we all deal with difficult, um, you know, difficult news. And um, I just want to say that I'm so thankful for all of you. I mean, one of my, you know, ways of coping with difficulty uh, in other, uh, you know, political arenas is, um, is through focusing on what we do have control of, and, and that is, you know, in, in our in our city, in our community. So, so thankful for all of you, and I'm thankful for this for the city. And um, you know, we don't always agree all the time, but I, you know, appreciate that we can have such direct uh, interactions with um, that change here. So, thank you for being a part of that. Uh, just to note that early voting for the August 14th primary actually began this afternoon. I took in my first vote, so uh, that's happening. Uh, overseas requests should be on their way by Friday, which is the deadline. Uh, also, uh, the sort of ad hoc non-citizen voting working group met last week and came up with a rough draft of a possible uh, charter change. We bounced it over to Dan Richardson to lawyerize, and um, there's going to be another I haven't put this out there yet, but there'll be the next big community meeting will be 6.30 on Tuesday, July 24th. And yeah, I'm, I'm clearly in an advocacy position, so if it does get on the ballot, I, I will recuse myself from certifying the final vote. Okay. Uh, just a couple of things before we have the other thing. Um, we do have, tomorrow is our TIF application before uh, Vermont Economic Progress Council. It's a fairly lengthy day. The mayor's going to be spending most of it. Sue and I will be involved with it most of the day. Uh, any of you are welcome to come in, especially the afternoon part. There's no formal role for you. It's not points against us or you if you don't come, but it's open. And if you'd like to see what's going on, that's that. Uh, that's happening. We have had a parking group uh, to talk about some of the parking pressures and I think even some route stuff. Um, Ken Jones, resident but also state official, has been kind of leading it. Uh, it is includes someone from National Life, people from the downtown, um, people from um, GMT, uh, city of course, uh, state, BGS, about the short-term crunch that we have but also uh, what some of the changes are going to be. And we are looking at, there's a 
a good possibility of a, or at least one re not too remote lot being secured. Uh, in fact, we're in final stages with that. I can't really announce it yet, but um, it's close. Uh, and then how can we use, um, maybe reroute the shuttles? Um, the schools are involved in this as well. They're talking about maybe using some public transit to meet some of their older kid transportation needs. So could routes be set to um, you know, coordinate? So uh, looking at the, how could the circulator fit into this, the capital shuttle, uh, how could all that be done? And are there other strategies that can be used? So uh, it's coming together. We've been meeting about once a month. Uh, and I think every meeting progress has been made and there's actually actions have been, like I said, securing this lot, for example, um, have been, so we're, we're finding our way through. That's all I have. Okay, so we need to go into executive session. Um, is this one of the ones that we need to find? No. Oh, okay. I move pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A2. Then we go into executive session. Is there a second? Second. Everybody say aye. 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 <coughs> we will not be returning 